I will call um, the meeting of the Pawtucket School Committee to order at 631. Ms. Lisley, please take a roll call. Mr. Ella. Yeah. Mr. Shabna. Yeah. Ms. Grant. Yeah. Mr. Knight. Here. Yeah. Mr. Larby. Yeah. Mr. Marino. Yeah. Ms. Doobie. Here. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the so glad to see so many people here to uh, watch our school committee meeting. Um, <laughs> and I will uh, pass this off for our first item, which is recognition. Uh, Dr. McWilliams, we have recognition of our high school basketball teams. Yes, good evening, everyone. And it is wonderful to be here surrounded by you. I just want to say to the players out there, you have made our day. I know that you have also made your season, but we are so proud of you. So we're here to honor and recognize you tonight. I would like to start by first bringing up, we have four teams to recognize. So start by bringing up the principal, Christopher Savastano, and the athletic directors, uh, athletic directors, Mr. Campambiano, Dino and Mr. La Liberty, so come right up. So we all we all know that it starts with great people that you have that are leading your team and your school. So we, yeah, and we'll do Shay separately. Too. <laughs> um, like we're trying to do this in order because um, it's a lot. It's a lot. But we, we just so appreciate your leaders and we want to recognize them. And I'm actually going to also call up. We're starting with the Tolman High School basketball boys freshman roster. And I'd like to call up Coach Kimball Crossley. So, Coach. Congratulations to you and your team. And now guess what? You get to do the work because you're going to um, call up your students. And what I think would be the best thing to do is just call them up by name and maybe we can have them go uh, do a U right over there so we can get a picture. Yes, we usually would, um, we usually would shake hands with all the players, but COVID wise, we think that that might not be the wisest thing um, to have all of us shake hands. Um, so we'll have them maybe come behind us and we can uh, yeah, get a we picture. Can. Yeah. Yeah. I just I don't think it, I just wanted to say uh, that so Coach Crossley is the uh, head coach for the Tolman Boys freshman team. They won the Division Two state championship with a 15 and 0 record. I don't think he can do. Much The only thing I'll say, because um, my players know how I feel about them and I get kind of emotional talking about them. Uh, before this season, you coach freshman basketball, you never know what you're going to get. And the one comment I heard before tryouts even started was a couple of people in the school came up to me and said, oh, this freshman class is so much trouble. You know, I think it's maybe COVID and not being in school last year and not having discipline. Um, and but not my group. Okay, it was the easiest group of kids to coach I've ever had. And they were just so responsible and mature for freshmen, in addition to being a really good basketball team. All right, enough of that. <laughs> All right, um, Bala Diop. <laughs> Nicholas Blue. John Hilaire. <laughs> Cam Holmes, Cam Holmes, Desire Lettrin, Ricardo Lutz, Joel Medina, Daniel Simon Zayas, Jason Sanchez. Ethan Torres, 
And I know uh, Josiah Washington is, is sick tonight, but Josiah is a huge part of this team. Uh, I think that's everybody, right? You gotta go get in the kitchen with them. <laughs> Holman's already up, so I'm going to continue on with the Tolman Boys um, Varsity Team. Woo! Yeah! And our coaches, we have head coach Bill Coughlin. Could you please come up? Assistant coach James Sorrentine. So let me just let you have a little background here on the uh, Tolman Tigers uh, team. We won, uh, Tolman won their first divisional title. So they were the regular season champs. They had a 16-2 and two record. Uh, they won the reg regular season division crown, uh, which then we'll talk about Shea, who won the tournament, the playoff state championship after that. <laughs> Uh, but it was our finest year in a long time. I think it was, uh, I looked at the banners uh, up on the wall in 2003, I believe, was the last time that Tolman had won an outright divisional uh, title. So, again, the uh, regular season D2 champs, and here's Coach Call. Right there. Yeah, thank you. I just want to say thank you um, to the school committee for taking, tonight, taking time out to honor us tonight. It was um, a great season, a great bunch of kids, uh, winners on the court, but also great student athletes. Um, it was a pleasure to come to practice every day, and I have no doubt that these guys have great futures. So uh, I'll start reading off these names. We'll start with the seniors, Martin Lopes. <laughs> Jamie Bautista. Jayana Rodriguez, Rodney Wilson, Celine Vlop, Andrew Valentin, Eli Pompe Jr., Chris Berrios, Dembo Conti, Josh Hiller, Malik Janus, Isaiah Bruce, and John Hiller. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.
to every meeting because this is how exciting it is. All right, next I'm going to call up Principal Dr. Ash and we're going to move on to Shea Boys Basketball. <laughs> Assistant Coach Mike Neal, if you could come up. Head Coach Stephen DeMeo. <laughs> Assistant Coach Jackson Tavares. Um, first of all, I'd like to take a few moments to first of all thank the school committee for this wonderful night inviting both of our high schools um, for a wonderful year. I'd like to thank our superintendent, our two super, uh, sister superintendents for all your support all season. Um, it's been a little bit of a difficult year with having fans um, from COVID, but um, you allowed us to have fans at the playoff game, so we, we truly thank you for that. Um, I want to thank both principals, all administrations at both high schools. Um, for your support. I, uh, I want to thank our two high schools, all our student athletes. It was a absolutely tremendous year. I think one that we will never ever forget, you know, to have all our student athletes either win a division championship or state championship is something that is very, very special here in the city. And not only do you make the high schools very proud, but you made the city of Pawtucket very proud. Um, for myself and Frank, you know, we talk about 15 times a day and we are so proud of every single one of you, of what you've accomplished this year. And it's not only about winning, but it's about how you represented the city of Pawtucket while you were out there playing. So uh, it, it's something that we say all the time that we are so, so proud of what we've accomplished. Again, not the wins and losses, but just the wonderful young men and young women that you are. So I, I really want to thank you for my first year as a flight director. That is something that I can always remember. Um, so thank you. And I think the students really deserve a round of applause. Thank you. I'll, add, I'll add one thing here. Uh, Dino said it's not all about the wins and losses, but of course we're here because of a lot of wins and losses. Uh, not too many losses. And matter of fact, we played 89 basketball games. I did a little math today between the four teams here. The only basketball teams representing the two high schools, four teams. We won 76 out of the 89. So that's, that's pretty good. Um, I also want to um, just step aside for one second before I coach, uh, uh, call Coach Mela. Um, this young man, he looks great for, I think, 72, right? 71. 71. <laughs> uh, he is stepping down. He's retired from coaching. Um, and no way, no better way to go out than winning the state championship. But he's meant so much to the city of Pawtucket. But also to me, he's been coaching me. He's been a part of my life since I was probably in Little League. So, um, you know, we're going to miss him. I know he's still going to be around. But, you know, he, he was a Johnston in and out, powder blue. And we stole him here to come to the city of Pawtucket. And he's done so much for our student athletes. And Steve, we can't thank you enough. And we're going to miss you. <laughs> On, on behalf of the, the Raven basketball team, 
We'd like to thank the superintendent, the school committee for all your support, Dr. Ash. Rosie, where's Rosie? Yeah. Rosie! Yeah. Uh, we wouldn't be anything without my two buddies over here, Mike Neal and Jackson Tavares. You know, Coach Bill and I are very good friends. And over the summer, we were figuring what, what we could do to like unify more or less that east side, west side baloney that, that, that travels through the city. And what we came up with is we down the corridor, we would come two nights a week, the Tolman kids and the Raider kids, and we would practice every Tuesday and Thursday nights and, 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 and combine as one Pawtucket, you know, during that time. And then at the end of the night, we would scrimmage for a half hour and then all war would break out, but in a good way. You know, we, we split with them during the season. We, we beat them at the boys club. They came to the cage and beat us there. But our dream was always to get to URI and, and, and face them for the third time and, and who would have the bragging rights. But it didn't turn out that way. We were upset by Rogers. They got beat by a real good classical team and, and it didn't come out. But I want to thank the coaches from, from Tolman and the kids from Tolman, who, who I know from personal, uh, how hard they were to, to achieve what they had to do this year. And they, they, they were a, a fair basketball team and a, and a sportsmanship type of team to also. And I'd like to congratulate those guys. <laughs> All right. I'd like to introduce our co-captains. Mr. Enrique Sosa and Joey Reyes Solano. <laughs> the big guy, Isaac Ogatuba. <laughs> Jermaine Leno. Jalen Andrews. Alejandro Toro. The big guy we stole from BVP, Jordan Mendez. Another big guy, Malik Mateo. <laughs> Jose Torres. <laughs> Jason Smith. <laughs> Devante Cruz. <laughs> Clemson Silva. Emmanuel Ibadabo. <laughs> oh, I need to do some, what do you want me to do some twice? Jenny Lewis Solano. <laughs> and last but not least, Eliza Ebola. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right. And one more, I'm going to ask both principals um, Sabastano and Dr. Ash to stay up and have the coaches of the And also, assistant coach Andrew Magret, <laughs> team manager Jeanette Borges, uh, before we announce the young ladies, I'd just like to say a couple more words. Um, if, if anybody got a chance to see our young ladies play, um, just tremendous. And the one beautiful thing is that when we co-op, when we co-op in a few sports, but last year we co-op in girls softball, and you can see that the, the two high schools coming together is just a beautiful thing. And now this year, as I, I, as I get to, to really view the two schools come together with our young ladies, it, it's absolutely beautiful. I know hopefully that's what the city's coming to and bringing our high schools together. Um, it's just a great thing to see. And if anybody got to see our young ladies play this year, um, we're going in the right direction here in the city. And, and I hope that moving forward, this is what we're going to see see with all our sports teams, but more importantly, this is what we're going to see with all our students, not just our athletes. Um, and, I, and, I, and Coach Bunky and, and the other coaches did a great job. So not only did they win a championship and a state championship, but again, their behavior on, on the court, because most of the games they were up by 90, um, and, and, and they never, ever, ever rubbed it in any team's faces. I, I got more positive words from parents and coaches from the other teams about how they handled themselves on the court up by so many points. So again, as, as your athletic director and as a past administrator or whatever coach, that is what we look for in our student athletes is how you are behaving. So when other, in this world where you see in the NBA and all this other stuff, all the trash talk and all this other stuff, when you guys could have done that and you didn't, and I think that's a tribute to coaches and all of our coaches, um, you see the tone in you see the shade everywhere. So again, we thank you. Coach Bucky, come on up. Thank you guys, I appreciate that. Uh, I've been truly blessed to, to be here for my third time in, in seven years uh, for bringing two championships to Tolman and now a first championship to a, a co-op team uh, for the city of Pawtucket. Uh, Shea High alumni, I uh, graduated from Shea. I went to Jenks uh, Middle School. So I'm just blessed to be able to give back to these student athletes. Uh, thank you guys for entrusting myself and our coaching staff. Uh, I do apologize for that email that I sent you guys for asking for fans to come to the game. That was me, I apologize. I <laughs> uh, we thank you guys. Uh, I think this year is probably more special because we broke that barrier as uh, uh, the AD said early between Shea and Tolman, uh, this is long overdue. Uh, our city is too too small to have these student athletes competing against each other. Uh, we should be one unified as one. Uh, I'm blessed to be a part of that and to have these special girls. Yes, yeah, come <laughs> Try not to cry. <laughs> <laughs> First time, all right. Uh, Coach Curl, it's your fault. <laughs> uh, these girls were amazing from, from day one. Uh, no animosity, no Shea's better than Tolman, Tolman's better than Shea. First day they got in the gym, they, they gelled from day one to the end. Uh, we had a smooth season, no issues whatsoever. Uh, every game was a, a blessed game. Uh, the girls paid attention, they wanted to get better, they got better every year. Uh, they took pride and breaking down that barrier that they are not the, just that inner city kid who was just out there playing basketball. 
Uh, they're respectful on and off the court. Uh, they hang out together. I trust them. I told them my phone's always on any time of the day or night for them. Uh, so I'm truly blessed that I have. Just thank you guys. Uh, great season here, ladies. Uh, glad you guys gave me this list because I give everybody nicknames, so I have no idea what their real names are. So just, just bear with me here. <laughs> uh, Jalen Fernandez. Carissa Montero. Benji Camaro. Alexander Laros. Kalani Jenks Ball. <laughs> Abriana A. B. Banicio. <laughs> Ariana Nike Blanco. <laughs> Kasai Fernandez. Kasai Ram. <laughs> Trinity Burke. Abigail, I don't know. <laughs> I think that's, uh, not here is Amani Rivera. Uh, I mean, this is I left her off. Uh, she couldn't make it tonight. Amani Rivera. Thank you. Thank you, guys. what the superintendent and all the coaches have said that it is such an honor to have you all here I'm sure that um, I'm sure that uh, you've heard it already but you've made us all so proud um, both on the court and off the court um, and I'm inspired by how you've been able to juggle your athletic and um, academic work to um, be successful and it will serve you well in the future um, as much as I think you would love to stay for the next four hours for our meeting, I also imagine that you probably want to um, go celebrate. So either choice is yours, but um, if you did want to um, go on your merry way, we, um, we, were well, we really enjoyed having you here. <laughs> and congratulations. Thank <laughs> you. 
know. And I still do see some students out there, so let's move on to our next item, special reports of student representatives. Do we have a representative here from Charles E. Shea High School? <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to tell you all about the Shea happenings, and first we're going to start with sports news, which you just heard a lot about. Uh, the Raiders boys, the Raider boys team uh, dream season ended in a heartbreaking loss to Rogers High, 51 to 49. The boys were led by Malik Matami with 14 points, and co-captains Enrique Sosa and Joey Reyes Serrano added nine points apiece. This year's team, this year's team won the Donaldson Lynch tournament for the. Uh, third consecutive year. They won the Division II state championships uh, on their way to an incredible 21 victories. Congrats on a great season, and we are all, so proud of all of you. Shea, the Shea Tolman co-op team, a.k.a. Showman, walked away with a tournament when, um, wait, I'm oh, sorry, walked away with their chins up and hearts full as the, as the Division III state champs and the pride of two schools and an entire city. The girls uh, coaches would like to thank all faculty, administration, coach camp, parents, and all the fans who have supported us throughout the history making, this history-making season. Our unified basketball team played a great game on March 10th as they fell a little short to Juanita Sanchez. Uh, we are so proud of you all for the way you played. You guys bring us so much joy to, uh, to Shea High School. The boys track team finished their season at the JV State Championship meet on February 14th. Joel De Cruz broke three minutes in the 1,000 meter run for the first time, running a new personal best in two, uh, in two minutes and 58 seconds, placing seventh overall. Uh, Omar Gomes also ran a strong 600 meter run. This t uh, his time was one minute and 48 seconds. Jaden Allen continued to show his improvement in the shot put, throwing over 33 feet. Congrats to all our competitors on a great season. Outdoor track will begin March 21st, and signups will be announced after February vacation. Uh, news from our Key Club. Key Club will be having a book drive this month, uh, the month of March, as well as a canned goods drive that will run through April. Drop off all donations to Miss Carpelli in the room 323 to help support your community. On February 19th, we held our first ever family film screening. We gathered to watch and discuss a doc the documentary Black Boys by Sonia Lawman. Our scholarship opportunity, uh, many scholarship opportunities have been given to our seniors. The senior class held a bake sale on March 3rd to the sophomores, uh, and the sophomores on the 10th. Both classes had great successes. We hosted a poetry slam on March 2nd. The Shea community got, uh, gathered and performed original songs and poems. Many teachers and our very own Dr. Ash was in attendance. Shout out to Chachi for putting this together, and the next one will be on April 6th. ASFAB testing will take place uh, at Shea uh, on Thursday, March 17th in the library. Uh, Shea High School robotics team, the Raider Bots, or also known as the Bucket Bots, were, bo were both first place winning uh, alliance in the 2022 First Tech Challenge robotics competition at New England Tech. Congratulations. Way to go, Verda and your team. We held our monthly parent meeting Wednesday, March 9th at 6 p.m. via Zoom. We were joined by Solanchi Fernandez from, college, from the College Planning Center, and she provided us with an update of expectations, deadlines, and resources available to college-bound students. The, the freshman class is running a bake sale on, March, or on Thursday, March 14th. Uh, for every item you purchase, you will be entered into a drawing of some gift cards in McDon of McDonald's and Dunkin'. The student council will be meeting on Wednesday in room 323 uh, to amend their student council constitution. And a representative from the Running Start program at CCRI will be at Shea on Monday, March 21st during the advisory period. Uh, if accepting this program, students will compete their senior year at CCRI and will earn high school and college credits. There are 21 seniors accepted into the talent development program at URI. Ooh, this, this is the last week where seniors can order their cap and gown. Uh, the senior prom committee is meeting uh, to discuss the senior prom. <laughs> we are having a senior movie night uh, next Friday. 
from 5 to 7 p.m. in the Shea Auditorium. I believe they're going to be watching Mean Girls, if, I'm, if I remember correctly. Uh, the 13th annual Shea Fashion Show, Refashioned, will be held on Friday, April 29th in, uh, at 7 p.m. at the Toman High School Auditorium. Tickets are available to purchase. And uh, just uh, in new club news, I, Zachary Pinto, started uh, a vinyl club at Shea, where we pick a weekly um, album and play it over the intercom as students are coming into the school. Uh, last uh, album, our previous album of the week was What's Going On by Marvin Gaye, and our current album is Lauren Hill's The Miseducation. And uh, that's all updates for this month. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a representative from William E. Tolman High School? Good evening, everyone. My name is Johnny Perez, and I'm a senior at Tolman High School. Okay, there we go. So this isn't as, isn't as exciting as the basketball team's, but I am excited to share some key highlights from our school from late February and some of March. So to begin with, on the 20th of February, the Tolman freshman boys basketball team finished undefeated and won the Division II state championship. The Tigers defeated Coventry High in the state finals. Semester one report cards were sent home on the 22nd of February. The Showman, the Shea and Tolman girls basketball team, as we just learned, won the Division III state championship on Saturday, the February 25th. It was led by Armani Rivera's 30 points. The girls defeated North Smithfield 48 to 40. On March 4th, freshman facilitator, Mr. Parada, presented awards to the semester one fabulous freshmen. These students were recognized by their teachers for outstanding academic progress and improvement throughout the course of the first semester. On March 5th, 35 Tolman JROTC cadets presented colors and marched in the Pawtucket St. Patrick's Day Parade. On March 8th, Victoria Quinn represented Tolman at the Pawtucket City Hall to observe National Women's Month. And finally, on the 8th, 20 students began an SAT preparation program after school with students from Brown University. The program is scheduled through April break. And that concludes it. Thank you. And do we have a representative from Jacqueline and Wash School? My name is Delana Degnan, and I'm a senior theater major at the Jacqueline and Wash School for the Performing Visual Arts. So first, First, our PTO hosted a Five Guys fundraiser to help offset the cost of upcoming events like prom during February break. Over the past month, we've held informal performance opportunities for each major to showcase and highlight the work of our students. It has been a great way to show the process and get feedback from peers, as well as gaining more experience performing. Fourth graders from Agnes Little came over to JMW for a green screen and special effects presentation. It was a lot of fun seeing their excitement and giving them a glimpse into the movie magic. Big shout out to Mr. Marchetti and Mr. Ashby for organizing this experiment. Our mock trial team, our mock trial team, sorry, season has come to an end after a tough trial against LaSalle Academy. The team is thrilled to have made it to the top eight in their first year and are already excited for what next year will bring. Our dance students attended a private presentation of festival ballets up close on hope performance and loved being able to see professional dancers up close. Our theater students have been, taken part in workshops with guest artists from the GAM Theater. So far, they've worked in areas such as clown skills, as actor training, and musical theater. Our sophomore dance majors have started dancing point, and we're super excited to sew their first pair of point shoes. We are so proud of our two, two current JMW students and three alumni who are all in the, the Academy Players production of Be More Chill. At the beginning of March, junior Ava Andrew was selected as a winner of the Wright Rhode Island annual short fiction competition. This was one of the most competitive years with 200 submissions, 40 judges, and only 20 stories chosen for pu publication. She was surprised and honored at school on March 2nd and will attend a formal award ceremony at the Newport Art Museum in April. And her story will be published in their year anthology. Senior Kate McLean loved being a part of the panel for the International Women's Day event. It was wonderful being able to hear from such incredible women in our community. We'd like to thank all who took time to plan the event 
and a big thank you to Chairwoman Erin Duby for working closely with Kate and the seniors from Shea and Tolman. Some upcoming events um, to start. This Thursday, we will be having a, the College Planning Center come to speak to our juniors about the college process. Next Monday, March 21st, our PTO is hosting an Uncle Tony's fundraiser with proceeds going towards supporting upcoming events like prom. <laughs> and finally, our student council is hosting a Penny Wars to help also raise funds for prom. The prom will be at Crown Plaza on Saturday, May 14th. That is all, thank you. Okay, uh, we are moving on. Our next item is public participation. Um, Ms. Liz, I do not see anyone signed up, is that correct? Okay, so we have no one signed up. Uh, the next item is approval of previous meeting minutes, 111 22, 111 22, 127 22, 215 22, and 217 22. Is that a motion to approve by Ms. Vanola? It's been seconded by Ms. Grants. Any discussion? Ms. Liz, will you please take a roll call? Ms. Vanola, yes. Mr. Chauvin, yes. Ms. Grant, yes. Ms. Benite, yes. Ms. Villarby, yes. Ms. Marina, yes. Ms. Duby, yes. The motion carries unanimously. The next item is old business discussion action items field trip for committee approval. Dr. McWilliams. Yes, I'm coming before you in request of this field trip, which was already approved at a previous meeting on February 17th. Um, however, it was incorrectly listed as Shea, and it's actually Tolman Decker. So I would like your approval for the Tolman Decker to take this field trip on April 22nd to the 26th to Atlanta, Georgia. It's been a motion to approve the field trip for committee approval by Ms. Grant. It's been seconded by Mr. Larby. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Uh, the motion carries unanimously. The next item is girls is new business discussion action items. Uh, girls future firefighter camp MOU. Yes. I would like to ask uh, CTE and Unified Ops Director Rico Pimentel to come up and I would like to say before he starts um, that this initiative was started by Mrs. Bonolo, I think about a year ago. Mrs. Bonolo, I don't know if you recall, she called me and she was watching something and she said it would be so awesome if we could have, you know, something like this. And so that started the discussion and here we are. So Mr. Pimentel, would you share about this pilot camp program? Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, I'm here to request approval for the MOA between Girls Future Firefighters Camp uh, and the Pawtucket School Department uh, and the city of Pawtucket for a camp to be held on April 22nd through the 24th. Um, Girls Future Firefighters Camp uh, is an organization that empowers young women to have the confidence and guidance to enter careers in public safety. Uh, Girls Future Firefighters Camp is uh, currently housed in uh, Hartford, Connecticut, and they will be bringing the program to Rhode Island for the first time, and they have chosen Pawtucket. Uh, Girls Future Firefighters uh, will create, recreate the day in the life of a firefighter for up to 25 girls uh, from uh, grades 11 and 12 from JMW, Shea, and Tolman. Um, they'll be certified in CPR and AED. Um, in addition, they'll experience physical training, uh, dispatch operations, hose line operations, ladder operations, uh, ropes and knots, uh, pump operations, law enforcement, uh, and so forth. Uh, the program uh, is starting here in Pawtucket um, as interest has sparked between our amongst our students uh, in high school uh, for protective services. Uh, we plan on uh, starting a protective services CTE pathway uh, at Tolman High School um, in the fall of 2022. I have a motion to approve the MOA by Ms. Vanola. It's been seconded by uh, Mr. Larby and Ms. Grant. Any discussion? Uh, Ms. Vanola and then Mr. Knight. Do you know how many students are interested in this? We haven't. Uh, um, we first went out to the schools to talk about the program. Uh, and after doing assemblies at all three high schools, uh, many students voice interest. However, we have not sent out these applications yet pending tonight's approval. So once we send out, once once we have approval, we'll send out the application. Okay, and for any members that would like to see what's happening, um, it's going to be April 22nd to the 24th, which is school vacation. Um, they will have a ladder truck downtown Pawtucket 
at the main fire station, I believe. It's actually going to be at the Newport um, oh, Newport Avenue. Sure. Yeah, it's going to be at the Newport Avenue Firehouse, right in uh, Slater Park. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're all welcome to attend. You all be you will all be invited to attend the graduation mm -hmm. ceremony they're having on the 24th. That's tonight. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And this is a collaboration between the city of Pawtucket uh, as well as other uh, fire firefighters uh, from Southern, uh, Mass uh, well, from Massachusetts as well as Rhode Island and Connecticut. Uh, Mr. Knight, did you have something else? Okay, Mr. Charbonneau? No, I just wanted to commend Ms. Bonolo for bringing this forward, the execution from our team superintendent, Mr. Pimento. Uh, yeah, and, and thank the, the, the city firefighters for uh, agreeing to hold it. I think it's a, it's a great, great event for our students. Mr. Knight, and Mr. Bonolo. Is the acting chief board into this year? Yes, sir. Yes. This is not. So this is going through legal land. This has been. Able, I know yeah. Mr. Mayor needs to sign off on it. Yep. So, so th this has been vetted by both uh, legal for school committee, uh, for the school department, as well as the city side. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the work that you put in to bring this to us. Thank you. I see no further discussion. Ms. Lissy, please take a roll call. Ms. Bonello? Yes. Mr. Schaubner? Yes. Ms. Grant? Yes. Mr. Knight? Yes. Mr. Charbonneau? Yes. Mr. Larry? Yes. Ms. Levy? Yes. Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Um, our next item is another MOU, Pawtucket School Department and Rhode Island Housing MOU. Dr. McWilliams? Yes. So I would also like to say this came um, started with a uh, school committee member Jay Chavano and also union leadership, uh, Ron Bopri and community uh, school coordinator, Emily Rizzo. When Emily, what I, oh, I said Rizzo, Rizzo sorry, Emily Malozzi. Um, the, you know, when, when we heard about rent relief and we, we learned that it wasn't really out there and people didn't know about it, um, Jay Chavano and, and union leadership and Emily Malozzi came to me and said, what can we do about this? So I'll kick it off to Mr. Chauvin, if you want to share about the MOU for Sure. I, uh, thank you, Superintendent. Um, listen, I, I didn't do anything other than suggest to uh, our partners in, in the union membership and, and Ms. Malozzi that maybe there was an opportunity here to bring a rent relief workshop uh, to our schools and assist some of the families that that may need help in filling out the forms and making that connection. Uh, I think this demonstrates the value of a community school and and I've said it before with Emily standing here. Um, what a tremendous asset I think she is in and all our community school leaders and and, and partners are in the district. Um, this is all Emily. She she got to work and and she had the contacts that I did not to uh, to bring this to our families. I think it's a win-win. I think it, again, it shows the value of that, that community school partnership. And when you have somebody like Emily and, and, and Jen and, and people who take this and, and, and run with it, you know, this was, this was a couple of months ago. And I mean, Emily put some work behind this and, and tracked it down and stayed with it, followed up and then delivered it to us. I would, you know, ask for the committee's unanimous approval on the MOU. Bless you. Yes, uh, um, do we have a motion to approve it? Motion to approve, yeah. second. It's been a motion to approve by Ms. Manolo. It's been seconded by Ms. Grant. Ms. Manolo? So um, one of the items is there will be a staff member, and this is all paid by grant, I understand. Yes. Okay, so there will be a staff member for a period of hours each week. Where will they be? So the staff member from Rhode Island Housing will be at our building. We're going to work out the time. We're looking at probably a Wednesday. Uh, they'll be available for families to come in and, you know, make appointments and help, you know, help families guide them in this process. And then their connection um, it, with our school department is Emily and Lamel Moore, our community um, partnership liaison. Okay. And, and, yeah, Ms. Manolo, I had the same question on number nine and ten kind of specify the building so on the back there that on our side we will allow access and accommodation in the family center and um a school department staff to supervise the building entrance and greet screen grant entry and direct visitors who are seeking help to rent relief 
but I, I really do commend everyone who was involved in this because there's a lot of programs out there to help our families, but it, it can be cumbersome um, to navigate the paperwork, complete the paperwork, and to even know what's out there. And this is just something that I think is really going to be helpful for our families um, and at no cost to our district, just a partnership, really. Uh, Ms. Marina, let us know. Well, if the um and even the um so and as the um so and as the the MOU was um sent out I had uh reached out to a little eagle who's who um who um who, 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 who um, sorry, just that I um, re use um, from the actual book. Ms. Manila? Um, do you know what's lifting? And I think this is wonderful that, you know, that they brought, that Mr. Shavno brought it to their attention and brought this in for us. Um, is this for our complete district? How will we reach out to them? And I also understand that they do have a bilingual translator translation intact and also it will go out. Um, we were waiting for this approval. We'll have flyers that will go out to our families and um, yeah, and it will be, they'll be centralized at our location. And it will be the complete district. Will be yes, will absolutely. Be okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Knight. Are we going to uh, make this for statewide as it's a statewide program? Are we making the effort to include everybody or are we just doing it for topic? Well, the, the advertisement will go out to our district and, and the expectation is the person's coming to our district on a Wednesday to serve our families. Um, I, I'm assuming that they will be making appointments with her you know, with that staff member. I, I, I would think she also operates out, out of the library other days and other locations. So uh, the focus of this program is really for our school department, not to say that we would certainly not accommodate anyone if they needed it, but the advertisement isn't going out to the state, it's going out to our school district. Uh, there's been a motion, it's been seconded. Ms. Lisley, please take a roll call, omitting Mr. Marino, who's recused. Ms. Vanola? Yes. Mr. Shavna? Yes. Ms. Grant? Yes. Mr. Knight? Yes. Mr. Larby? Yes. Ms. Doobie? Yes. The motion carries six to zero. The next item is approval of Rhode Island Office of Energy Resources to prepare RFP package for the lighting projects that PSD will bid. Ms. Devine. Hi, everyone. Hi. Okay, so on December 2nd, uh, John Cody, facilities director, had brought before the committee um, for um, exploring uh, a lighting project at Little Fallon, Curtis, Cunningham, and Jenks. So after that um, exploration, um, the Office of Energy Resources is interested in helping um, in funding um, 
doing some LED lighting. What we're here to ask permission for is to um, meet with um, Rhode Island OER and um, they've, they're creating an RFP for us for Pawtucket to go out to bid. We'll go out to bid. They'll be there to guide us. Um, and at the, at, at the end of that bid, um, we'll come back before the school committee, should you approve this, uh, we'll come back before the school committee with some um, numbers and, an, and a request or recommendation for an award uh, to do the project. The project is estimated to uh, cost slightly over $1 million. And with utility incentives, the estimated at Two hundred and two thousand in the balance at eight twelve to be paid by Rhode Island Office of Energy Resources. There's no cost to the district, um, so we'd like your uh, uh, we'd like to recommend approval for uh, meeting with OER uh, to to take that RFP and go out to bid. It's been a motion to approve by Ms. Panolo, then seconded by Ms. Grant and Mr. Moreno. Any questions on this, Mr. Charbonneau? Well, it's a 1.1 1 .1 or 1.2 million cost, but no, no expense to the district. No expense, no on-bill financing, zero to the Pawtucket School Department. Yeah, great job, both you yes. and John. Thank you. Legging this and actually, I have to give credit to Rye when we did the facilities um, projects uh, a few months back. Um, Rye had mentioned um, the Office of Energy Resources. We didn't think because we got we had gotten awarded um, so much from that that we weren't sure how this was going to go. But you all approved on December second to move forward to explore it, and so we're very um, um, glad that we did that. You allowed us to do that, so thank you. Yes, and I know um, Ms. Grant and I have been um, walking schools quite a bit, um, looking at special needs programs and just the difference that lighting can make. Um, We've seen it um, at the schools that have been done, and it's, it's exciting that so many of our schools are going to get, you know, um, this LED lighting. Um, it's been a little bit tonight. Um, I was going to mention how different LED lighting mm -hmm. is, you know, and how beneficial it is for our students, to, as well as being economical for mm -hmm. the district because it just burns less energy. But um, I just noticed on the last page here that this is executed by Tim Duffy, who is the executive director of RIA in, oh, that's that one. Oh, that's the next one, sorry. I jumped, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> well, in that case, I would like to thank John and Melissa for bringing this into the district and for, again, helping our students and staff. It's been a motion approved, it's been seconded. Oh, Mr. Knight, sorry. Why is this listed as a gas initiative auction proceed? Oh my God, I had that same question. Uh, I, uh, that's just the, the, the name. I actually, hold on, did I write, I wrote that down because I, I had concern when we first got this and John, um, we called um, National Grid uh, representative um, Jerry Drummond and that's the name of the um, regulation. Um, but but it is for lighting. I, I'm thinking natural gas. What does this have to do? But that's where they they had some. Um, it looks like they had some auction proceeds from the regional greenhouse gas gas initiative, and that's how they're funding the project. Mr. Knight. Uh, right now, I still believe the national grid is in the process of being bought. Is that still going on? Is that going to apply to this? Um, I don't. I uh, I will check that out for you. But I don't think that uh, I have been in contact with the um, Office of Energy Resources, and they have assured me um, that we're supposed to. If this is approved, we're meeting with them on Thursday to get the RFP ready. Uh, they should have it for us. But um, as far as that question hasn't come up, but I can certainly ask that question. I think they may have um, brought that up, but I don't think so. But I will certainly ask. So motion has been seconded. Um, Anastasia, please take a roll call. Ms. Benola? Yes. Mr. Shovna? Yes. Ms. Grant? Yes. Mr. Knight? Yes. Mr. Larby? Yes. Mr. Marino? Yes. Ms. Doobie? Yes. The motion carries unanimously. Our next item is approval of natural gas contract renewal. Okay, so. Um, on the agenda and. The contract starts in November of 2022, so we can uh, table it for, 
Is there a motion to table? A hearing no second, the motion fails. Um, the item Excuse is- me. It's, a, it's something that's involved in our agenda. It can't be moved forward. There's been a motion to table, hearing no second, the motion- We will be violating fails. state law. Am I correct legal on the interpretation mm -hmm. that there's not a second to table that we don't vote on it? That is generally the case on motions. However, there, if there's a question of whether we'd be violating the Open Meetings Act, that it doesn't it doesn't change the nature of the motion. It just means it may be worth further discussion or consideration. Um, I'm not I'm not aware of the defect in the agenda, but mm -hmm. I, I, I'd, I'd be happy to discuss it privately or. I'd be happy to discuss it privately or to figure out what the issue is otherwise. Mr. Knight, do you want to explain further your um, concern? There's a contract that is under a different title whatsoever from uh, Direct Energy, something or other. And I'd like the chance to review this with everyone before. We can't just push this forward when it hasn't been announced that way. I'm just asking that it be tabled for the next meeting. So the motion is tabled. It's been seconded. Ms. Liss, you please, uh, motion is tabled by Mr. Knight, seconded by Ms. Grant. Ms. Liss, you please call the um, roll on the table. Ms. Vanolo. No. Mr. Chauvineau. Yes. Ms. Grant. Mr. Knight? Yes. Mr. Larby? No. Mr. Marino? Yes. Yeah. Ms. Doobie? No. The motion um, carries four to three. The item is tabled. Um, the next item is approval of summer services agreement for Warren Parks and Recreation and East Providence Recreation. Ms. Knight? Um, so before you, um, as we do each year, um, we would like to recommend um, enter into a catering agreement with um, uh, two areas, and that would be for the um, Warren Parks and Recreation and the East Providence Recreation. Each year, we bring this before you um, to work uh, to deliver food to the summer programs, um, and the programs are uh, June 27th to August 24th for Warren Parks and Recreation and East Providence Recreation, June 27th to August 26th. I think this might be maybe the seventh or eighth time mm -hmm. that we've come forth. Mm -hmm. Second. So then a motion to approve on the approval of summer service agreement by Ms. Benola. It's been seconded by Ms. Grant and Mr. Moreno. Is there any discussion on this item? Ms. Benola. Um, Ms. Devine, we do this in Pawtucket too. The do we contract with the city or is it the school department? No, what we're doing is we're asking for our for the Pawtucket School Department's food service program to enter into a catering agreement. So what we do is we serve their food and we charge them a catering. Okay. Right. So we, we do our own here. East Providence and Warren, they don't uh, East Providence School doesn't have a summer, so that's why they act, they reach out to us and neither does Warren. Mm -hmm. The motion approved has been seconded. I see no further discussion. Ms. Lucy, please take a roll call. Ms. Manolo. Yes. Mr. Chauvineau. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Knight. Yes. Mr. Larby. Yes. Mr. Marino. Yes. Ms. Doobie. Yes. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, next item is Summers Divine, approval of budget transfers. So before you this evening, we have three budget transfers um, to request for your approval. The first one. Um, and the second one are related to each other. They are for Tolman High School and Shea High School, 7,500 for each school for college advising corp services. Um, we would like to, um, Tolman would like to uh, move the funds from the classroom supplies, library books and dues into the student support line. And um, Shea uh, would like to move it from a testing line uh, to the student support line. The third one is from Special Education Office. This is uh, for 175,000. This is to move it from the nursing uh, line to the personal care attendance line for additional uh, PCAs or behavior uh, specialist service um, servicing students in the district or 
yes, serving students in the district or at outplacements. Then a motion to approve the budget transfer by Ms. Vanilla. It's been seconded by Ms. Grant. Ms. Grant. Money that we have in the nursing contract um, that's going to be transferred to personal care attendants is that from the past couple of years with COVID or no? That was actually that's uh, again um, the budget uh, that was submitted uh, last April and then again revised in August. Um, there's unencumbered funds on that line, um, and so that's where Mock would like to take the funds from. Can I just yep. have a follow-up question? Um, so the personal care attendants, are they, I'm assuming they're not TAs and they're not CNAs? Correct, these are third-party um, services that are, um, uh, the PCA line is over, uh, maybe due to students that move within the district. Um, and it's for both, from what I understand, it's for both um, in-district and out-of-district, so we have um, I think we have a added behavior uh, specialist and then we have um, uh, students that are out at outplacements that have um, needs of a personal care attendant. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Charbonneau, Mr. Larbe, and then Mr. Marino. So, uh, Ms. Devine, so we are fully compliant with our nursing obligations to us. I, I just I don't see how we pull 175 thousand out of the nursing budget and and move it to personal care attendant. It's again the budget was submitted last year. But um, but the budget is a, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but we know how many students require nursing services, right? Mm -hmm. I, I would assume that the special ed director does. Yes. So we just. Oh, maybe they were students that moved out of the district, they, or they we just have. miscalculated the budget by 175,000. I'm, I'm unable to answer that question, and I apologize for that. But uh, again, um, it is unencumbered, and it doesn't appear to be coming at this uh, late stage. So, uh, if I had to guess, um, maybe students moved out. Maybe we have a few students that had nurses, and they no longer are Pawtucket residents, and maybe they're, you know, maybe they were outplacements. I, I would be. Um, just guessing at that because again, each department head prepares their own budget and and I don't mean to put you on the spot. No, that's do you okay. know do you know what that that line is budgeted at? It's it's I believe that it's it's almost at eight hundred thousand at that at in the FY twenty two, but don't quote me it's somewhere around seven or eight hundred thousand. Wait a minute. The budget's at eight hundred thousand and we're saving hundred and seventy five thousand from the budget? It's not, it's not incumbent right now. Um, so that means that it's not being utilized. Well, so I'm going to give you a heads up. I'm going to ask about the nursing budget as you guys go through this prep mm -hmm. for this. Mm -hmm. right. That's okay. You can. I mean, again, we take the budget um, from each department head. And, and again, we, quite, we uh, make some questions. But again, it's not my expertise on what type of nursing services we would need. It could be. I'd have to ask the special ed director. But it could be that students... You know, nurses are expensive, and if we had three or four students leave Pawtucket and go to another district, we wouldn't. We would no longer be paying tuition or nursing. Right, and that I could understand. I just I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know those details, unfortunately. But if Mark was here, I'm sure he could answer. Got it. Uh, Mr. Wabi. Uh, to clarify, the the college advising core is that the the college advisors, the AmeriCorps program that's in the two high schools. Program, but it is the College Advisors Corps. Yes. Okay, cool. I, I think I might have to recuse myself from this role uh, as I have a personal relationship. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Miss Mr. Mayor, are you good? Okay. Uh, Ms. Vanilla. Um, oh. Ms. Devine, can you find out exactly and let us know? Sure. I won't hold up the vote, but can you sure. let us know why we ended up with sure. such a mm -hmm. difference? Sure, okay. absolutely. Ms. Sharman, do you have a further? Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so I see no other um, questions. Ms. Lissu, you please um, take, a, take a roll call vote, omitting uh, Mr. Larby. Ms. Manolo? Yes. Mr. Sharman? Yes. Ms. Grant? Yes. Mr. Nay? Yes. Mr. Marino? Yes. Ms. Doobie? 
Yes, motion carries six to zero. Thank you. Um, and now we have, yes. Lobby and Mr. Marino should be uh, reported as abstained. Okay. Um, motion carries six to one abstain. I was going to suggest that it seems to be five zero. Oh, was, yeah. they were they they abstained on different ones. Oh, I'm abstained. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, the next item is update on menstrual vending machines and approval to purchase additional equipment and supplies. So back on September 30th, the school committee um, voted to purchase um, from McKesson Medical uh, 30 uh, vending machines, uh, no charge, um, and supplies to place um, to be compliant with the Rhode Island general law, um, providing students in the secondary um, from actually from grades five through 12. So that first purchase was um, our secondary schools. Uh, we had been told that it would be about three weeks to get the uh, machines in and um, it took uh, until a week of February vacation. So as soon as they came in, we were ready. John King actually um, installed them into the middle and the high schools. Uh, we do not have feedback on um, supply usage because they were just um, put in over the last uh, week and a half or two. Mm -hmm. right. And um, so um, with that being said, I mean, we'll be happy to report out um, how it's going, but what we'd like to do is come before you with the long lead time from um, we place the order uh, of the very next business day after um, October 30th. And um, since it took that, that time, we'd like to purchase 25 additional um, in order to be ready to install these prior to the school year when we have to be um, in compliance with the law at the fifth grade level. So in addition, what I'd like to say, I'm asking for 25, we do have the money in the budget. We did budget um, the funding. Uh, we're going to buy some additional supplies after um, with some of the funds from the, the state MPA, which is McKesson. Um, but we, we wanted to purchase the 25 now in case of the long lead time. And we'd also like to, we thought about, and it, it's greater than the 25, we don't have the number yet, but we'd like to add on top of it uh, for winters and submit that through the bond um, rather than having um, the vendor purchase, um, so that way it's not a mock-up. Uh, we'd like to increase it for um, uh, the fifth grade area. We don't have a count. It could be like maybe six or eight. We're not sure, um, but we would like to increase that um, if it's okay with you. This is all not, this is not a bid. This is from the state MPA. We're using the same vendor who honored the same price, and I'm hoping that, that if I add five or six more, if you allow, um, that they'll give me the same price. The price has increased a little bit because after December 31st, their price on the MPA goes up. He did honor the, um, the prices. Mm -hmm. a motion to approve by Mr. Charvin has been approved and then seconded by Ms. Vanilla, Ms. Grant, and Mr. Knight. So the 25 that's in order are gonna be for fifth grade. Yeah, the law requires us um, to have um, fifth, uh, from ages five to 12, Grades uh, five to no. twelve. Sorry, right. grades five to twelve. I apologize, but we also at the last time we did all of the gender neutral bathrooms. We did a nurse, the nurses' bathroom, and then we did um, the secondary um, bathrooms, the multi-use bathrooms. Um, so with that being said, we had Chris uh, go to all ten elementary schools and then add in the nurse and any gender. And that this is not staff because the law is requiring us to provide for students. Um, mm -hmm. So with that being said, you know, you might need to have one if there's a multi-bathroom, you know, near a cafeteria because the fifth graders are using that or mm -hmm. um, something like that. But, but we added 25 and then, like I said, we put in a few just in case there are any that break. Um, and again, these are removable like the ones in Shea and Tolman. If the schools change or whatever, these are removable. They're just attached to the wall by John staff. Um, and we could repurpose them, but we put in a few just in case any are broken, become in, broken. In each of the elementary schools, there'll be one in each of the nurses' offices, also just in case. Right. The children. We yes, we included the nurse, we included the gender neutral, and we included um, near the fifth grade. Whatever you know, if there's a different floor, I'm not familiar with all of the schools, but the wing or the floor or anywhere where they could possibly be, um, just so that we ensure that we meet the needs of the law. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Mr. Knight. Uh, I'm looking forward on the agenda. Okay, it says purchase additional. Um, we are not allowed to amend the um, 
agenda, but we can amend what it says on our regular meeting because that's not, it's just a question. So I, I don't really have a problem with adding more, mm -hmm. uh, but I think in the future, we need to know this in advance. I don't think there'd be a problem with, because it says to buy additional, it doesn't have the number on it. Right. Mm -hmm. right, and again, we just, we just, talked about that um, between today and yesterday and I only thought of it if you choose that you didn't want to but again it's off the state MPA you're not violating a bid or changing a bid mm -hmm. um, but I figured I'd mention it because there did be a 30% mock-up if we had the vendor do it even though we get 91% back if you're using the bond there's a 30% mock-up to have the vendor purchase them on our behalf mm -hmm. so to clarify um, Ms. De Ms. Devine um, what is the number that you're asking for the approval for so john what's the safe number for the new winter school would you say an additional eight eight to ten so it, uh, how about if i just say eight and we'll go with the number eight and we have 25 and eight so 33 yeah mr knight i don't think because of the way it's worded on the agenda we can put a number on it okay okay i see i see what you're saying there okay so we would be approving um the purchase of additional equipment and supplies um perfect yeah okay and perfect I, and i i do want to um i know that my daughter has reported um she came home the first day and she said hey we finally got that because she's been <laughs> asking um when we were going to um get that in and she said that all of her um classmates at the middle school level especially were very excited about it because that is a hard age um and mm -hmm. so um they were just excited that this was going to be something available to them. So I think that I'm very happy that our committee approved this as early as we did, because as Ms. Glad. Devine asked, she mentioned to me that she just had an email letting all the committees know that they need to get on this. And knowing the lead time, a bunch of other districts are looking to do this now. And mm -hmm. I'm happy that we are all set. So thank you. Ms. No, Canola. thank you. You brought it to us. Well, that's what I was going to say. Okay. I wanted to um, thank Aaron. Ms. Doobie for being proactive in bringing this to our district before it even became law. We met last summer, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so we have what we need and we're compliant. Yes. And our students will be satisfied. Yes. Thank you. Um, there's a motion. It's been seconded. Uh, Ms. Lucy, please take a roll call. Ms. Manolo. Yes. Mr. Chauvinow. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Knight. Yes. Ms. Larby. Yes. Mr. Marino. Ms. Doobie. Yes. The motion carries unanimously. The next item is 2022 policy subcommittee schedule. Mr. Larby. Yes. <laughs> okay. There's been a motion to approve, approve the 2022 policy subcommittee schedule as outlined in our um, in our uh, packet here. Uh, it was a, well, the motion was by Mr. Charbonneau and the second was by Ms. Vanolo. Any discussion? Mr. Knight. Are we required to put a uh, notice in advance on policy? We are not required for any of the subcommittees. However, some subcommittees have decided that they'd like to give advance notice to their committees. And any vote taken at a subcommittee has to come to the full. Um, that right. goes without saying. Mm -hmm. The point is, you're kind of locking people into something in advance. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. So, Ms. Bonella? So the reason to do that, Wellness has the last Friday of the last Friday, of, uh, last Monday Monday. of every <laughs> month. So Steve has locked in to Wednesdays. Um, all of the policies are picking their days. So with so many meetings going around with facilities and admin, then they have an idea and we don't have Diana checking all people to find out when a convenient date is. It just makes it more expedient on everybody, I believe. Mr. Knight? Unfortunately, we don't know who's going to be here next January. Well, we didn't go to January, just December 21st. <laughs> And then who knows? What's that? <laughs> and then who knows? That's right. Um, okay, there's been a motion, it's been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, the motion carries unanimously. 
The next is um, to change uh, the school committee work session date from March 31st um, to March 24th, 2022. I um, was looking at my own kids calendar and realized that our March 31st is not only a professional development day, but also a teacher conference day. So um, it's, we would not have the smiling faces in front of us. Um, and that would be a shame uh, and also not equitable to our faculty who wouldn't be able to attend. So um, I brought this to the attention and um, these are approved dates. So we would need to uh, bring this to the committee to vote to move the date to the previous Thursday, which is March 24th. Been a motion to approve by Ms. Vanola. It's been seconded by Ms. Grant and Mr. Moreno. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. And we'll see you all next week for that. Um, uh, the next item is to change the special needs subcommittee meeting date from April 13th to April 6th. Ms. Grant? Um, I had asked Ms. Judy if we could have this on the agenda. Unfortunately, I am not going to be available on April 13th and some of the items that we're going to have on our agenda are part of our previous discussion. So um, I really did want to be a part of that. So um, I spoke to the committee and we felt that this change would be um, would be in our best interest. So, and a motion to approve the change of the special needs subcommittee by Mr. Uh, Charbonneau has been seconded by Ms. Um, as we know, they're still, you know, in their building and, and the, there's been a concern about the particular areas that have not had um, camera coverage. So we're looking to add cameras to the coach's door, to classrooms behind the stage, the stage area because classrooms go up behind the stage. And those classrooms behind the stage are the keyboard classroom, the studio um, classroom, the regular music room and the percussion room. And these are areas that, um, you know, we, the, the administration has found can be uh, quite challenging. And so adding cameras to that would be uh, really beneficial for safety. So Hirsch, I don't know if you want to have, say anything more. Yeah, I, I think the superintendent pretty much summed it up there. I was asked to get uh, some cameras installed. So I reached out to some vendors and what you have there were the floor plans that I sent to the vendors, you know, what they uh, sent back. Uh, based on the request for nine additional cameras in that area. Then a motion approved by Mr. Charbonneau has been seconded by Ms. Grant and Ms. Manolo. Um, I, um, uh, Ms. Grant and then Mr. Charbonneau, then Ms. Manolo. Um, so I'm assuming all this time we haven't had cameras there. Um, have Is there a problem or is there something like I know like the stage area and things like that people really aren't supposed to be in the auditorium. Right. So I'm assuming is that locked during the day? Or? Yeah, the auditorium isn't locked during the day because they actually go to the, there's, there's classrooms behind the auditorium and above the stage. Um, so the stage itself is not being used. But they have found that it has been a problem area. The coach's door, that whole stairwell that goes up behind the stage on both sides, and they have had issues in that area, which is why the request has come, you know, for those cameras. But actually using the stage, they don't use it, but they have found that there's an area that they have to continue to monitor um, throughout the day. Okay. Mr. Chavin. On the same, I guess, on the same line, I was under the impression that the auditorium was sealed off for safety reasons. No, I don't think so. Yeah. No, it's just the stage is off. Yeah. Okay. So just the stage just is the sealed stage off. Is sealed off. You can still use the exterior. I think you would use the actual auditorium itself to see because you can't go in and off stage. All right. And the coach's door is, is what? The, his office? The coach's office? No, it's the door that the students would come in if they wanted to come in. 
in the, the games. Oh, I, 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 to be honest with you, Dr. Ash left, and I thought she was going to be able to be here to speak specifically to that coach's area, but there is a door that, that doesn't have camera access. Yeah. They have had issues with. Ms. Vanilla? Oh, sorry, Mr. Sharma, are you sat? Yeah, I just, uh, I, it's not clear to me what, why we need, why we need cameras there. I, and I'm not, that's all right. I, yeah, it's not, it's not clear to me why, why we ask for the cameras. If. Because the cyber stag will only go up in these days. But it's not, it's not a, an area that we should have frequent travel in. These kids should be going up there to go to class. And, and right, but there's a stairwell from the bottom all the way up, so there's there's access, there's access to the classrooms and then access down. Right, and are we saying that the kids are congregating in the stairwell? Is that? I, I they have had some issues. Not all kids, but they have had issues in those areas, which is why they put requests for the. I, that's that sounds like a, a management issue at the school to me, quite honestly. Uh, they they either belong in the stairwell or they don't belong in the stairwell. Ms. Vanilla, so are these cameras movable? They, After, what you have there is the installation. The wiring wouldn't be the cameras itself. So we could take take down, but it's the wiring. Like the proposal is both for the cameras yeah. and the wiring to to do that. Okay, and also two phones. Yes, yes, the, the wiring for the phones. The classroom? Correct. Those are for the classrooms in the back. Mr. Knight. Are those classrooms or those band rooms? Classrooms. So it's a keyboard class, studio class, the regular music room, and the percussion room. Where are they? What numbers are they? Uh, I believe they're 382 and 383. And then the band room. On floor two. Okay. Mr. Knight, is that the answer to your question? Or I'm just trying to figure out where the stairways are they're talking about. The 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 auditorium, the stairway is on the side of the auditorium that go up, mm -hmm. I believe, and I think they have a classroom on the third floor. Um, the band room is on the third three, floor. Three, three, three. Only, only get to by going through the auditorium. Yes. The side, yeah. the side room there. That's I think dangerous. That's dangerous. The same way. Yes. Yeah. I can't hear you. Yes. No, it's dangerous to get up there. In either case, that's uh, why are we using those rooms as classrooms? Is there a means of egress? If they go up the stairwell, they have to come back down the stairwell. The oh, same okay. stairwell. There's no way for them to get out the other side. But you have to have two points of egress, right? That's right. Go on. That's what I'm looking at. You're Walk up the stairwell, you can go into the place straight across, you can go up the other side. Okay, so you, but it doesn't show that. This doors, this door is a connect. Um, um, oh, sorry, Ms. Ms. Grant, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I know they were mentioning that coach's door, door or whatever. On this one on the bottom floor. So face in, cameras face in, 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 out. Is there any further further discussion or um oh Mr. Knight? Um, I see that there are stairways drawn in on both sides of the side C, but I don't see any way for a secondary egress except through the auditorium. Am I correct on that? But downstairs, going through the auditorium. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so if there's fire in the auditorium, they're stuck up there. 
outside door? What outside door? There's not one listed. Yeah, so you drive into the pool and go to um, the parking lot and the garage. There's a door by the stage mm -hmm. that um, a lot of teachers use to get into back mm -hmm. um, to get into the pool. Mm -hmm. So there is a door back there. Mm -hmm. But I was going to ask if we have um, fire extinguishers and things up there. Yeah, fire extinguishers. Who's so tonight? There is not, from what I'm seeing, there is not a stairway from the band room, third floor, a separate stairway, down to the uh, exit without going through the auditorium. Am I correct about that? That's what it's showing. It's showing everything goes through the band room. Uh, I'm sorry, the auditorium. Uh, now, there might be an exit on the floorway, but I don't see an, effort, an exit on the third floor. So I think, I think we are a little bit off the topic of the actual security cameras, but I think we've raised some interesting um, questions about um, fire yeah, safety. So Table this until we know the answers. There's a motion to table. Is there a second? There's been a, there's been a motion to table by Mr. Knight. It's been seconded by Ms. Grant. Um, Ms. Lucy, please take the roll call on the table. Yes. Mr. Shaw, no. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Knight. Yes. Mr. Larby. No. Mr. Marino. Yes. Ms. Doobie. No. The motion carries five to two. The um, item has been tabled. Um, the next item is condenser replacement at the administration building. Hello. Um, I'm here for uh, trying to get approval for replacement of failed and outdated condensers at the administration building. This is for building number three. We break them up in, th uh, in thirds. It's for two 10 ton, 10 ton and one 15 ton air condenser and uh, air handlers. Uh, the condensers needing replacement have exceeded life expectancy. Unit one has been inoperable since I've been on the job. Over the last several years, these units have needed constant attention from our vendor, which is ATC, and our, our, our contractual vendor through RFP and our maintenance staff, sometimes even several times a day during uh, cooling season. Um, what would be part of this job would be to replace the 15 ton condenser and air handlers, the 10 ton uh, condenser, demo and removal of old condensers, demo and removal of an abandoned chiller that hasn't worked in years, uh, roof repairs after the demo, redesign of the base and the curbing for the units, crane and, uh, for removal of the units on multiple days for removing the demo and bringing in the new units. Materials, electrical, piping, refrigerant, and reclaiming tanks. They'll also pressure test and start up units. I came to this committee back last year through Melissa to put money into capital to fund this. But through savings in my budget and speaking with Melissa and Herm helping me out, we won't have to use the capital money that we set aside. I'll be able to use money out of my own budget. So we could use that money for something else. Uh, the price was 135872 and it's on my recommendation that we uh, approve the proposal from automatic temperature control. And a motion approved by Ms. Grant. It's been seconded by Ms. Vanilla. Mr. Knight. Have we checked with anybody, any other vendors on the cost to replace these? There are there are contractual vendors. I have looked into the units. That's for repair and maintenance. That's no, they can all the they repair, maintenance, and replace. They also replaced our valves. They also replaced our, our uh, controllers last year also. We went through legal to confirm this. Um, I spec'd out the units in which they're gonna be putting on the roofs, which are Bryant units. And for what you usually pay for, uh, just say an average one ton unit, it's an average of 1,000 to $2,000 uh, per ton. This is right in the middle range for these units. Um, prevailing wage obviously is always uh, uh, the big part of any of these jobs, which is at 53,500. 
But last time they did a job for us, they were at our building for close to two to two and a half weeks. And I expect more people to actually be on this job. Plus we have the roofing work and we also have the materials and the crane operator for that. Mr. Chavez. Yeah, just, I'm missing something. How, sure. how does this compare to the work we did at Kirby? Or is that, is that more a Holly question? I'm just, the price, the price has struck me as being very inexpensive. You're welcome. No, no, I'm okay. Absolutely. No, no, you, guys, is, you have my full support on this, no, no. John. It's coming out of your budget. No, the, the units that they put on there are night and day compared to what we're putting here. This, this will, this will last three spaces. But I, I honestly don't have the expertise to talk on the difference between the two. All right, but there, there's considerable difference. Yes, I will say so. Okay. All right. Ms. Vanilla. So, the new condensed units that you're putting on the roof will work with our old controls that we have in our building? It will, it will, it will work in it. The problem was always with the condensers themselves. Okay. Yeah. So, the rest of the controls are good. We should be fine. We also had controls put in through heating for the same building last year through approval of, of this committee which put in new thermostats and everything. So that was the setup for this. Okay. Yeah. Mr. That the vents in all of that building are all connected? Yes, we did have somebody go through that initially. We had our engineering go through that building several years ago to give a diagram to make sure that they were working. We also had initial issues with the vents for the, when we were doing the controls and those were worked out through ATC to make sure everybody, as of right now, the heating season that we had through ATC through the heating from the, um, from the diffusers, we've had zero complaints since we put that in and that covers IT and the business office. And this is the same thing. Mr. Knight. John, not that I know that you're wrong on this, but I do know that I personally in the past have observed several offices with black molds going on their uh, vents in the admin building. And I was told at the time by Dennis Labello that there were vents that were disconnected in the rest of the building. Do we know that not to be true? I can't speak to that. I, that that's something that Dennis would have made a, a remark on. I'm just saying I know that what we have right now is currently working. If I would have a problem, somebody would have brought it to my attention because trust me, if it's either heating or cooling, because those buildings become like a closed up box, especially during the summertime. If there was a problem, we've had occasional people come in. We had somebody question something in the admin area probably about a year ago. I did complete testing of not only that area, but three floors and the outside and everything came back clear. And a motion, it's been seconded. Ms. Bliss, you please take a roll call. Ms. Vanilla. Yes. Mr. Chauvin. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Knight. Yes. Mr. Larby. Yes. Mr. Marino. Yes. Ms. Doobie. Yes, the motion carries unanimously. Next item is combined high school report by Fuss and O'Neill review and next steps. Mr. Chauvin, I know this went to the facilities. Are you going to present this or are we? No, I, I will kick it over to Patrick and Kathy. I, uh, just so this committee knows, it, it, we did get into some detail at the facilities meeting. I specifically asked that for this meeting, we keep it kind of high level as to, uh, I think we had spent uh, upwards maybe 45 minutes to an hour on this topic at the facilities meeting, but uh, Kathy and Patrick are better boys to walk us through it. Thank you. Good evening. Kathy Ellithorpe from SLAM Collaborative. Happy to be with you again. And I am immediately going to turn it over to Patrick in the, to be expedient. Uh, and he's going to describe the work that they have done. Thank you, Kathy. Good evening, everybody. Um, like Kathy said, my name is Patrick Dowling with Fuss and O'Neill. Um, and I just wanted to give you a um, kind of a thumb, thumbnail description of uh, what we had, what we've completed at the McCoy Stadium site. Uh, as uh, discussed last week with the uh, facilities committee. Uh, so we were uh, retained to conduct uh, kind of two uh, concurrent but separate investigations uh, at, the, at the property. Uh, one was a geotechnical uh, investigation uh, and one was an environmental investigation as part of uh, due diligence for um, high school uh, planning. 
Um, so just to start with the, with the geotechnical uh, results, so both of these uh, reports uh, were provided um, to, the, um, to the school committee uh, the city last, uh, beginning of last week. Uh, so this is uh, pretty fresh uh, information. Uh, so the, the results of the uh, geotechnical investigation, uh, we primarily focused on the footprint of the proposed, or the, at least the conceptual school footprint um, uh, on the, uh, the stadium site. Uh, and uh, it was in addition to some work that Foster O'Neill had done uh, that was funded by the state uh, a few years ago, which was more of a uh, more a general overview. This was a little more targeted uh, at the school footprint uh, to get some subsurface information. Um, and the, really the, the uh, the big picture results of what the geotechnical investigation uh, found and confirmed from our previous review uh, was that there's uh, approximately 10 feet of uh, really unsuitable soils uh, near the surface. Uh, it's a combination of some, uh, some urban fill uh, soils, uh, fill that was placed on the site uh, during some filling activities back in the, back in the 40s. Uh, and below that, there's uh, several foot, uh, up to five foot thickness of some organic peat material. Um, and uh, and the, re the real end result is that that material is not very, is not suitable for uh, sub you know, sustaining a, a school or any kind of um, large building on it. So there's going to need to be some um, ground improvement or uh, consideration of that material uh, in the foundation design of the, of the proposed building. <clears throat> uh, and our geotechnical engineers really identified three potential um, big picture um, options for foundation design. Uh, one was uh, pile supported um, structure. Uh, so driving piles down to uh, 30, 40 feet until there's some really solid material and some bedrock at about, at about 40 feet or so. Uh, another option uh, was uh, complete excavation, a removal of the unsuitable material uh, that has some, um, you know, it's a significant disturbance and there's also some cost implications. Uh, and the third option, which at this point is uh, likely the, uh, like the preferred um, recommended uh, option to pursue further uh, is a ground improvement um, option uh, including the construction of some geo what are called geo concrete columns uh, so that is a method where you um, drill down uh, and install um, aggregate and really concrete uh, columns into the soil uh, to support the, the school building uh, so that was uh, um, at this point that is but likely the um, you know the, the preferred or recommended um, uh, option as being uh, the most cost effective and um, believe the um, conceptual uh, plan and, and budget for the school did acknowledge or um, acknowledge the fact that some subsurface improvements uh, would likely be necessary uh, just based on the, the history of the history of the site. Uh, the other uh, investigation that we did is uh, environmental in nature. Uh, so that included um, investigation of uh, three primary issue and potential environmental issues at the site, uh, groundwater, soil gas, uh, which is um, you know, vapors beneath the, beneath the ground, uh, and soil quality itself. Uh, we got a very positive, uh, very good results for um, the groundwater investigation and the soil gas uh, survey. Uh, which are really kind of key um, items that the regulatory agencies want to make sure that um, you investigate fully uh, for a school, you know, for a school facility. Uh, so we got really good results uh, on both of those media. Uh, to um, consistent with what we found in the geotechnical investigation, uh, we did find several feet of this urban fill soil that was used to fill at the site which did contain some regulated compounds uh, that do, um, that will trigger a reporting requirement to Rhode Island DEM and the implementation of a, um, 
uh, a remedial process, which will likely um, consist of providing a, a clean fill cap uh, throughout the entire property as part of redevelopment, uh, which is um, really pretty consistent with um, any type of redevelopment in an urban environment, uh, like you know, and pretty much anywhere throughout Pawtucket, you probably might find similar conditions. Uh, especially any any anywhere that there's been some previous development and reworking of uh, of, of soils, um, so that cap will um, um, be somewhat of an uh, amended um, uh, approach to the to the just the site development itself, uh, which might require some additional clean fill put on top of the site, in addition to you know the the, the typical. Um, earthwork that would be required for, um, you know, for construction of landscaped areas and, and asphalt uh, and building services, uh, but only in the matter of instead of, you know, for example, in a landscaped area, um, instead of putting six inches of loam, you would need to put six inches of clean fill underneath the six inches of loam throughout, throughout the entire site. Uh, so that's the, you know, that's the, that's the big picture. Uh, the next steps that, um, are required uh, is that, like I said, there is a notification requirement to Rhode Island DEM, uh, and then there will be a public participation requirement uh, for before the, the state will approve of the complete, as the deem the site investigation uh, complete, uh, and then there will be a, a supplemental document that needs to be submitted to DEM that details the, you know, the implementation of the, of the cap uh, throughout the site. Um, but all that work will, will, would need to be done concurrent with, uh, with site development. Can I just clarify, just so the committee is clear. So are, are you saying that the next step, which is this filing with um, the DEM, that's not an immediate step, that's something that occurs once there's a plan in place to actually start developing the site? Or are you saying that we need to have a motion today to kind of submit this to yeah, so there, there is a, a, an immediate requirement. So there's a 15 day okay. notification requirement. Uh, once you um, identify that, there, that these conditions exist, uh, there's a 15 day requirement, um, statutory requirement to submit notification to, to DEM. But the actual remediation and construction um, is, will be scheduled you know, with construction of any proposed improvements at the site. So you, so there, so just like I said, I just want to make sure I got this clear. Um, you would need a, you would need a motion tonight from this committee to file this, to move forward with filing this. That wasn't part of the original scope that we would file it. Yeah, correct. It was, uh, you know, there was some expectation that that might be an outcome okay. uh, of the, of the, uh, of the, of the program. But I guess, I mean, it's up to the okay. committee, I guess, if you need to have, have a motion for that. And I think now, we'll, I don't know if we'll do a motion just yet or we'll just have discussion and questions um, in the discussion stage here. And Mr. Charbonneau? Uh, a couple of things, Patrick. So um, one, the preferred method of, of build is, is something that, and, and maybe Kathy can speak to it. it in, the, in the discussions we had with the facilities committee, Kathy, and the, go ahead, Kathy. You, you, I think I know what you're asking about. So um, if I'm not sure that I don't expect you to remember, we had a line item in our budgeting um, for, I believe we called it, I think it was soil improvements or something like that, but we had $12.5 million set aside because we knew there was gonna be things that we had to do on this particular site to stabilize the earth, to be able to, put, to build on top of it, to take care of some of the environmental things that we expected were gonna be there based on history and whatnot. Um, so at this point, there's money in that budget that we've always been talking about uh, to take care of these items because they were anticipated and um, actually, as Patrick told you, some of the things have come back better than we thought they might. And the ground improvements for the you know, structure that we would need to do are consistent with what we expected in that cost estimating process. And right. the, the pillars in the structure the foundational structure was part of that initial that 302 yes million dollar number because we always knew it wasn't going to be a normal traditional regular foundations that and and this is be. within that that um kind of cushion area yes. okay yes thank you and i think it, it 
if I may, when we get to the motion, or, or we could ask Santiago, our, our legal counsel, if uh, our other legal counsel has arrived as well. Both, yeah. <laughs> um, we have two now. Would we do it in the form of an amendment with the existing SLAM contract, as we did initially, I believe? Right. I don't think we had an, an initial contract with Foss O'Neill. I think we did it for the filing. You mean? Yeah, for the cost of filing. Right. So could we, in essence, make a motion that to amend the slam contract to fifty thousand, or to get us through this next piece of it? It looks like our attorney is in counsel. If we could, offer just I just want to have Mr. Sharpen's question once later. Um, do you, Mr. Sharpen, do you want to hear the response first, or do you want? I would like. Or, or Mr. Knight can go, and when we get to make the motion, Attorney Conley can, can direct us how to make okay. it, if we're going to make one. If I may, I think what I, if I may add to the conversation, it may uh, affect whether or not you make the motion. Okay. Uh, so, I, I apologize for interrupting. No, no, absolutely. Uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm familiar with the original agreement. We went over it carefully. Um, I did... Uh, read the report and uh, slept well afterwards, thank you. Uh, I'm not an engineer, uh, but I, and I wasn't at the facilities committee meeting, but because of the nature of this discussion and uh, critical issue represents, I did want to get the speed on. Um, given what um, I understand, this is, and, and the scope of the project, this is really more in the nature of a change order, as opposed to a scope that creates a contract amendment. So my, um, my advice to the committee is that the district treat it as a change order rather than a full contract amendment because I don't think it's warranted given given the scope of it, given the scope of it, and the funding that's available. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but thank you for allowing me to um, provide that information. Mr. Sharpen, does that answer your question? It does. Okay. Um, so at this point, um, other questions, Mr. Knight? Uh, I'd like to read something. <laughs> Um, I gotta find it right now. It's in two pages. Jerry Sherlock, who also grew up in Pawtucket, everything else down to 45 feet. How can we say we can just put stanchions into what? 15 feet and we're gonna build on it? The, the history of it, and I found this in bottom of the 33rd by Dan Byer, Barry, say, states that they put tons of concrete, over $1.5 million worth of concrete, in $1939. I don't know what that would uh, be in 2022 uh, money, but I don't think $12.5 million covers it. And anybody wants to read the book, I'll show it to them. So I, oh, Ms. Ms. Grant, you can have your questions. So I just want to make sure. So no matter what, because we have results from the land, we have 15 days to report this to the DEM, it doesn't mean that we're going to proceed, correct? Because I know we still have a lot of, there are a lot of things we need to figure out before we move forward. But I just wanna make sure that um, this isn't us committing to it yet. This is just us following through, correct? Yeah, so the, um, the notification requirement um, will result in the, um, uh, commencement of, uh, of the regulatory program. So that's the, in, that's the, um, the commencement, the uh, identification to the Rhode Island DM that there, that there are some regulated soils on the site. Uh, it certainly doesn't commit the city to move forward with a school project here, uh, but it will, and the, and the, and the timeline, 
the, the timeline of remedial response is always tied to redevelopment activities at the site. So ultimately, something will happen at the property uh, as far as redevelopment. Um, and this will initiate the regulatory process where whenever that redevelopment happens, uh, there will be some uh, remedial response actions necessary, whether it's a, you know, whether it's a school site or a commercial redevelopment or a residential redevelopment, whatever it is, um, that will, this will follow that process. Ms. Oh, sorry, Ms. Grant. Would we be, um, is there a payment or is the work that has to, that we're going to be responsible for if we didn't proceed by doing this particular thing? By reporting it to the DEM? So the um, yes, there will be there are some obligations. So you do will will need to complete the um, the regulatory permitting. So there's a you know we did a we did a, a very comprehensive environmental investigation. Uh, the next piece of information that Rhode Island DEM is going to want is what they call a site investigation report. It's just a little bit of a different format. Um, of a report that they want. Um, so that document will need to be prepared. So really the, the process is notification, DEM acknowledges that you've notified, they will ask for this additional report. Um, the owner of the property is obligated to prepare and submit that report. Um, you know, the timeline can certainly be negotiated with, with Rhode Island DEM, uh, but there are some uh, response actions that the city is going to have to do, um, not necessarily to the point of, you know, constructing anything at the property yet, um, but there are some some submittals that will need to be uh, uh, made to DEM. Mm -hmm. And what would you think the approximate cost would be? I don't think we're going to need to do any additional on-site investigation because we we did a lot. Um, so the overall, so there'll be a, a couple reports that will be submitted. You know, maybe it's in the probably maybe ten to twenty thousand dollars worth of work to do a site investigation report, uh, and then this remedial action work plan, uh, and then do this um, uh, do the public notice activities. Okay, thank you. And, and you said the owner, which is the city, is um, that there is an obligation to prepare and submit this report. Yes. Yeah. You, there will be a response from DEM that asks for it. Okay. Um, Ms. Benalla. So the areas that you tested, just to provide clarification, you tested where we propose um, to put the school. So what you found beneath that area is acceptable to build. On. Yeah, so the, the geotechnical investigation was very targeted at the, the footprint of the school building. The environmental work we did was was throughout the entire property because the whole entire property, you know, the, the anticipated development will involve the whole property. So there will be soil, you know, management required throughout the, throughout the site. So, uh, yeah, so the the, the environmental investigation covered the covered the entire property, and um, yes, the existing soils are certainly environmentally suitable for re, for reuse you can definitely reuse the site as long as you have this this clean fill cap that's that, that's imported during development okay. so um tonight okay i'm reading your soil bonnet boring uh, report which i already read by the way uh it says starting at ground level find a medium trace gravel at five feet, find a medium, some sill, trace wood, black, moist, no color. At, I think it's eight feet, I can't read what it says, but at 10 feet, it finds sand, find a course, some fill, little gravel, gray wet, no odor. Then we go down to, and I'll just paraphrase this for everybody. Um, I believe it's 48 feet. Sand, find a medium, silt, trace wood, flat, moist, no color. So you still got water down to 45 feet. 
at 48 feet, you've got some silt, silt, gray, wet, no odor. And it's 60 feet, you've got the same thing. How the heck are we planning to build the school on a pond? And that's what it was. Yeah. How can we plan that? You can't tell me you can build platforms that are going to stop kids from getting asthma problems, um, allergy problems, mold problems, and everything else, and build it on a water pump. You can't tell me that. So the the, the site is certainly saturated as, as you know. Gr there's groundwater everywhere. Mm. Every, every site has groundwater. Not like the, this. The, the, well, yeah, actually. So the so I, I, we found groundwater starting at a depth of between five and ten feet below grade, mm -hmm. which is which is pretty typical for you know this area of Pawtucket. So that was going to be my question. That um, so how common is it? I mean, I'm sure you've done reports like this. Um, how common is it to see similar reports that would need ten to twelve million dollars? I, I forget what the number was of remediation in this way. Um, to do this ground improvement um, foundation design and how effective have you seen this strategy? You gave three options and you said the third one was kind of the direction that you would advise at least. Um, so in general, were, did you see, did you, when you investigated this, did you find it to be abnormal or along the lines of other investigations? Uh, no, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's, it's very common. And these um, engineering solutions are well proven and um, and and they will work. Mr. Chavez, I think the, you know one. I think this committee did its its job in the due diligence in in expending this additional hundred thousand or whatever it ends up being. Um, and my takeaway from it during the the facilities meeting and again tonight is that. You can build a high school on, on, the, on the land and, and we can get wrapped up in, and listen, I've, I've, I think I've been vocal on my wanting to proceed slowly here. I think when we look at the total site preparation being anywhere from six to 10% of the overall construction cost, yeah, 15 to 20 to 30 million is a big number, but it's still only 10% of the overall project cost. So, you know, I don't know nearly enough about any of this stuff, and that's why we hire the experts, and I'm going to go by what they said. And, and again, I, I was a proponent of walking very slowly as we proceed here, and I still am, but I think this report indicates that we can build the school we want to build there, I think with minimal um, or, or certainly less expenditure than I initially thought. And... Uh, I think we, we we keep moving forward with this cautiously, but I, I think this is a, a positive development in our due diligence along the way. And for this item that does say um, uh, next steps, it's, it's so it's report by Fuss and O'Neill review and next steps. And we've spoken about one of those next steps, which is this filing. Um, I think that at a certain point, this committee's work to prepare for a possible unified high school does come to an end until we actually have an approved bond to say that we have the money. So at a certain point, our, our committee, I think, does have to either, I don't know if it's a formal um, vote that we um, send a letter to the mayor or to the committee that we would like them to put forward a bond. Um, and I welcome the committee kind of weighing in on this or legal or colliers or whoever um, understands. I think that our committee has a few questions that we still need to resolve. Um, one of them is a question that obviously came up the last time we had this conversation, which is, is this three high schools being rolled into one or is it two high schools being rolled into one? Um, that, but that is a um, hypothetical discussion if there is no bond. Um, so I think we need to find out if we do have approval from city council um, and, and the mayor or just city council. Um, 
the legislature um, from city council and the legislature to put a bond on the um, November election um, ballot. That's the word. Yeah. Uh, 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 Ms. Grant. Chair Judy, um, I also have um, another concern that I think we need to kind of get an answer um, for. Um, if we do proceed with this high school, one of my concerns is how it affects the other schools in our district. And what I mean by that is, you know, we, we do have a lot of schools that have not been touched yet. And I, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to be cautious with kind of like Mr. Chabonneau, you know, taking small steps. Um, because I think a lot of these schools, you know, need need maybe not knocking down, but I think they need to be like a Potter's or a Nathaniel Green. And um, I guess I'm concerned about how this high school would affect, you know, a Cunningham and Agnes Little in the future. Um, if Slater were to move to Shea, is, is where is the money, how is the money being distributed to pay for this? And are we going to be able to do another bond after the high school one, or is the city going to be focusing on safety complexes? And I think that's something we really have to look into because um, our schools are old. Um, and, um, you know, there are a lot of schools that have not even been touched yet. Just the basics, um, you know, just, you know, the, the sprinklers, the alarm systems. So, so I think there are a lot of things that we as a committee do need to look into besides who's going to attend in this high school. Mr. Chabonneau. Uh, I, I agree, and uh, Chairwoman Duby, to your comments on next steps. I, I think it, there's a couple. I, I think we have to answer that question. What, what becomes of, of the rest of our master plan? I think we have to we have to absolutely answer the enrollment of the new unified high school. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can go out to the voters for a bond saying that we'll answer who's going to attend that high school after we get a bond approval. Um, and you know, and then I obviously we we have to have the, those conversations with the city and then the, the council. Uh, but that's the go forward. I think this committee has taken. The due diligence part of it, the reporting part, the the analysis part of it, as far as we can. I think now it's time to start answering the those hypothetical. What what happens if who's going to attend that school, mm -hmm. and then what becomes of the remainder of our master plan if we go out for a two hundred million dollar bond um, and, and withdraw the the hundred million we've had set aside for our high school. So, so, Mr. Charbonneau, as as the chair of the facilities, I'm I'm uh, throwing this a little bit back at you to ask. So, are you saying um, the order that you see, and obviously the co-committee um, can weigh in, is um, we as a committee need to resolve what are we saying the makeup of this school is, and then once we have a number of enrollment, we then would formally ask the city to put forth a bond if that obviously, obviously we would vote to see if we want to formally ask the city and at that point um we would start looking at a stage one of um or or are you saying that at that point we just sit and wait for the bond to come through yeah no i think we we would start a stage one right I'm, and holly can probably speak to it better than i but i think if the city were to back this and, and get it going i think we would we would simultaneously start working on a stage one in anticipation of bond approval. It, I think it, yeah. the, okay. the, the question that needs to be asked is what happens to the rest of the district? And that would be part of a stage one of a, of a am I correct? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm just trying to clarify that a stage one would look not just at the high school, but would look in general at a long term plan for the district. Well, I think the stage one is going to be just the high school because that's all the money we have and that so mm -hmm. the the question for this committee becomes is building a unified high school are we willing to not 
renovate or remodel six or seven other schools in the district in order to build, at least that's what it is in my opinion, because once we go out to the voters for a $200 million bond, I don't know how much sooner we can go back out to them to, to allocate mm -hmm. more bond funds for us. Okay. So th thank you for clarifying that for me, Mr. Knight. Uh, the city council was informed by bond council this year that the most that the city could afford to bond in the near future is $200 million total. So again, it would stop everything else. We couldn't go out for another bond for 15 years. Um, okay, so I, I think um, we need to, um, I, I would like to say, um, first of all, thank you um, to um, everyone who worked on this, um, this tome of a, a study. Um, it, when I saw it, I was like, wow, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of information. I'm so glad that you um, explained it so fully. I, I was able to understand it. Um, and, and I, I personally think that, um, this unified high school is, is a very good idea for our city. I think that we were originally going to be renovating two different high schools, both of them, um, using old layouts that as we're even, you know, talking about the buildings, you know, um, just what you can do with a fresh canvas is what we've seen at other high schools. And not only have we seen the results of the high schools being built, but also the results of um, what it's done for the communities. So I, I, I do hope that um, this is the beginning of us being able to move forward with this, but obviously this committee will have to answer um, some questions at the next meetings and whether or not we need a motion tonight, I guess is on that um, filing would be uh, the motion that this committee would make. We do not. Okay, it's part of the process. Thank you, Mr. Knight. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, Holly or whomever can answer this. Where do we get 12.5 million when the previous report commissioned by the state of Rhode Island, and I believe Mr. Conley would know about this, said it would cost us $35 million in site work for the same piece of property. Where do we get that? I've seen the report. I don't know if you guys have. 35 million versus 12. Come on. Who are we kidding? I don't know if you want to. Okay. Uh, so I believe the report that you're referencing is one that you had shared with Holly. And it was a report that was done by Peregrine. Uh, and it was done, I believe, in 2019. And it was uh, about refurbishing and renovating the McCoy Stadium to continue to be a stadium. Um, it was probably back when there was one of the ballpark conversations about upgrading that. So you're correct, it, it did show $35 million, but that was improvements and renovations to, to keep the stadium as it is and improve it. $35 million was for site work, not for the stadium itself. That was for site work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know if this is okay. about site work. No, the, there were there were several tables. So the the, the pendulum report, I think you're referring to. Um, so the, they 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 provided a 35 million dollar um, total site redevelopment uh, estimate, which was civil engineering, mechanical engineering of a building, structural uh, repairs to the to the building itself, and renovation of the uh, of all the systems and the stadium itself to be used as a stadium. So there was, um, I don't know the exact number, but there was a few million dollars, I believe, for site work. There was um, a lot of million dollars. It was 35 million. I've read it three times. Yeah, well, I think the, I the 35 million, I believe, was, uh, was the total else package. Mr. Mr. Charbonneau, yes. I think one of the things, any of us that have been to McCoy to watch a game hit after a rainstorm or during a rainstorm, notice down in the bottom levels, there was water. The water was getting in. Okay? That, but you're saying that's not from the ground up. It, this is coming as runoff because it's down in that, that gully? Yeah, correct. The, the, currently, the, the site is, is graded. It's kind of a bowl. Uh, and so it does not have appropriate drainage. 
Uh, and, uh, and one of the problems with the, with the stadium itself is that uh, there's a lot of water infiltration into the structure, which has caused a lot of damage to the, to the structure itself. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a concern building a new unified high school on, on the pillars using the concrete slab that we're going to have water infiltration <laughs> like they did at McCoy. No, the, the, the water issues at the current McCoy Stadium are uh, it's drainage. So it's rain, precipitation, not, and uh, unsuitable drainage conditions because Perfect. it's a bowl. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Mr. Knight. Okay, so we're saying that McCoy is built in a bowl, that it has water because of that, and we're not filling that bowl. Am I correct? It's still going to be there. No, the this, this site will require uh, renovations to the grading to promote positive drainage. Uh-huh. And for that reason, we're going to be $23 million less making a high school there. We're not going to have any problem with sinkage of the uh, building. We're not going to have any problem with kids having problems with asthma, uh, air problems or um, allergy problems, mold problems, or any of that, you're going to guarantee it? Well, cer certainly there will need to be engineering measures put in place. As with any, any construction project, uh, you're, you're going to need um, vapor barrier, drainage, all, you know, all those um, modern engineering and construction design techniques will need to be implemented. You didn't answer me. Are you going to guarantee we're not going to have a problem with mold? Well, I'm not, I'm not designing, I'm not on contract to design. Oh, okay, facility. how about you? I'm not on contract to design it yet either. <laughs> oh, so you're not going to guarantee it at this point. Not today. So you don't know if your report is accurate or if it's fantasy either. Is that what you're telling me? Mr. No, Knight, I, Mr. Knight. I, I'm still asking him a question, not I, you. Mr. Knight, I'm just saying that respect to the people speaking. They're getting meeting. respect, believe me. Please tell me where we have a $23 million difference because we're going to have to call, tear that stadium down. And they're still saying there was that much water um, infiltration in the water from Hammond's Pond, which is what it used to be known as. And they had concrete um, infiltration. And we're not going to have it. Are you kidding me? Ms. Vanilla? I would like to make a motion to mm -hmm. refer this back to the full committee for discussion of future events. So what, what's the, uh, so you want it to be on the next agenda for discussion, for dis a discussion item? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a discussion item of future steps. Correct. Okay. Just not discussion action, just discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Benolo has made a motion um, to put it on the next agenda as a discussion act, a discussion item of next steps on the Unified High School. Ms. Grant has seconded it. Any discussion on the motion? Oh. Ms. Moreno and then Ms. Wami. Be unable to to um, take an action. If it was a discussion only item, it would not be able to have an action. Mr. Larby. Um, I agree with the motion. I just wonder if um, if it's better served to have a, uh, a separate special committee where we solely focus on, um, on this item and discussion. Uh, Mr. Charbonneau? Yeah, I, I I disagree. I think the question is is before us. I don't I don't see a reason to kick the can down the road. I think if Mr. Knight has an objection, he can certainly voice that objection. And we, we but we can revisit this item for the next three years. Mm -hmm. I mean, this committee made a decision to expend a hundred thousand dollars to hire a professional firm to conduct a professional analysis of the site. And that professional firm has stood before us tonight and explained to us 
that, you know what, it's probably not an ideal site to build on, but it's not a disaster to build on either. And again, this committee expended the, the dollars <laughs> to, to provide some renderings um, from architects who we have are engaged with in the district. Mm -hmm. And they're telling us that, yeah, they can work with this site. And that they've already budgeted for up to, I think it's around 18 million, if I remember correctly. I know it was 12 and a half, and then I think there was a $6 million premium mm -hmm. that got us somewhere near 20. I, I, I don't know what else there is to discuss about this item. Ms. Vanilla? It wasn't this specific item, it was the high school in itself. So I believe the item to make a decision. So the item is listed as combined high school report by Fuss O'Neill review and next steps. So Mr. Charbonneau, are you saying, um, and, and I, I understand we're, we're still in discussion on the motion that Ms. Benolo made, but are, are you saying that you have a different motion that you would make at this point? No, well, I would ask Ms. Benolo to withdraw her motion. And, and if her motion is to discuss this committee's thoughts on going forward with the building of a unified high school, I think that makes sense. I think if we're going to say, oh, okay. So, so what, once in other words, I accept their report mm -hmm. and I accept the feasibility that we are able to build on that property. Mm -hmm. So we need to decide next if we're going to do it or not. Well, so I think that, um, so like I said, if, if this item is listed as next steps, and as I, I asked Mr. Charbonneau to clarify from the facility's perspective, we, at this point, he, he said that he believed, and the committee can decide if they agree, that the next step is to decide um, whether we are going to build a high school and what the composition of that high school is. Um, and, if that, and so that could go on the next agenda. Um, on the work session in which we just moved to next week. Um, that, um, but like I said, I, I'm just unclear if we would, it would be a, cause we can't approve a high school if we don't have money for it right now, but so it would be a approval of um, enrollment in a unified high school and our committee voting on our endorsement of this idea, essentially. And I would have to look at legal to see what we would even list this as, because I think that what I'm hearing from a few people is that we would want a formal vote of this committee of whether this committee supports moving forward with building a high school on the McCoy site and what the makeup of that high school would be. And Mr. Conley, you want to respond? That, um, if that were a motion, that, that would fall within the, um, uh, well, how the agenda is posted in terms of next steps. You are, that does identify next steps. Okay, okay, wonderful. Uh, Mr. Knight? I am in favor of building a new high school, just not at the McCoy site. There are other places to put it. McCoy so, needs too much remedi remediation, and we're not, we're not even talking about what DEM's gonna tell us to do yet. for the uh, next agenda identification. Mm -hmm. Discussion action item, yep. Yeah, I, I, would, I would ask that you consider making it a discussion item. The first time it appears on an agenda, if it is as a discussion action item, you're gonna have a packed house and, and it is going to be a very emotional conversation. I think if we put it on as a discussion item and we get some some semblance of, of where the community is on this, we've heard from the JMW community, mm -hmm. but we haven't heard from anybody else. Ms. Liss, um, can you clarify right now we have, um, how, is that a pretty packed work session that we have? I know we have a few recognitions that we're doing at the beginning. 
Okay, and we have the budget meeting the following week, so it won't be a it won't be a budget heavy meeting. So this could be a, a, essentially, unless something else comes up, a fairly one item work session. Okay, wonderful, Mr. Knight. I believe that we should do a maybe a special meeting because there's going to be people from all three schools here. I think we should find out what they've got to say. So, but if the work session is already posted and we we don't have many other items on it, we could essentially have this be, we could make sure that we notify the schools that that's what we're going to be discussing. Uh, Ms. Grant. Um, kind of on to what um, Mr. Knight said. I don't believe it's just gonna be the three schools. I think it's gonna be more schools because we don't know yet how this high school will affect Agnes Little, Cunningham, Slater, you know, we haven't, we have to, we need to make sure we have that discussion. Mm -hmm. um, because, um, like I said, you know, Slater is over 100 years old. Mm -hmm. It's actually, I believe it's actually older than Potters is. So, you know, if this is actually going to affect that, I would think you would have some of the community for that. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about the high schools, mm -hmm. it's about the whole district. Mm -hmm. And that conversation could happen along with this uh, uh, as we weigh the pros and cons of a unified high school at the McCoy site. Okay. Um, good night. The McCoy Stadium site was originally known as McCoy's Folly. Is this going to be the city administration's folly? Build the high school on wetlands? So I, um, I, I'm planning to put this on the work session agenda. And um, legal will be sure to uh, review the wording to um, include that it's a discussion of the unified high school at McCoy and um, the makeup of that high school. Okay. Yes, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Manolo. Um, and thank you again um, for staying so late with us and I'm um, sharing that report with us. Um, so the next item is, um, Mr. Charbonneau, we have um, three recommendations from the Facilities um, Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the Facilities Committee recommends that we go out for RFP for the construction management at risk approach for Baldwin Elementary School. It's the similar approach or the same approach we've used at Winters and we've used in the past. Uh, we find that it brings value to the project and so the committee was unanimous in its recommendation to this body that we approve a CMAR approach for Baldwin. Motion to approve. Second. Then a motion to approve by um, Ms. Marino. I was seconded by Ms. Manolo and Ms. Grant. Um, any discussion on this? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion carries unanimously. The next item is um, elementary schools. Oh, Mr. Charbonneau, you can just continue. These are your items. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The elementary school media centers, Slater Middle School, cafeteria, architectural design. Holly, are you going to take this one? And again, this was a unanimous uh, decision recommendation from the Facilities Committee. Uh, good evening. Yes, it is the recommendation of Colliers that DBVW Architects is chosen to do the design for the six elementary school media centers and the work in the cafeteria at Slater in the amount of $162,240. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion to approve by Ms. Grant. It's been seconded by Mr. Marina. Any discussion on this item? Uh, do we need a roll call on um, award of proposal? Yes. Mr. Knight says yes. Uh, Ms. Bliss, will you please take a roll call? Ms. Panola? Yes. Mr. Chavano? Yes. Ms. Grant? Yes. Mr. Knight? Yes. Mr. Larby? Yes. Ms. Marino? Yes. Ms. Dubey? Yes. Motion carries seven to zero. Um, the next item is PSD temporary realignment of facilities department for construction projects. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Uh, the facilities committee is, is making the recommendation that we authorize the superintendent and Chief Financial Officer to engage in conversation with our Director of Facilities. Um, the Facilities Committee itself thought with all the projects going on across the district that bringing Mr. Cody away from the day-to-day -day, um, 
running of the facilities makes more sense. Um, we also thought that that process needed to be formalized in a way that there's a backup for Mr. Cody that's brought on board. And then Mr. Cody is able to divide his full attention um, to the project. Certainly with, with multiple projects going on throughout the summer and, and into next fall across the district, having uh, John's expertise and his ability to get from place to place makes a lot of sense for us. So that was the recommendation that we authorized the superintendent and CFO to engage with Mr. Cody on a, uh, a realignment of his duties in a formal process. Motion to approve. Second. And a motion to approve um, the recommendation of the facilities subcommittee by Ms. Vanilla. It's been seconded by Ms. Grant. Any discussion on this tonight? Uh, are we declaring Mr. Cody in a different position? Are we taking him out of his current position? That would be the, that. That was the idea of the facilities committee. Okay. He, so if we do that, does that leave the um, option for him to go back under our currently constituted uh, agreement with him? I don't think there's a agreement with any of our people for leave of absence from their position. I think it it was the it was the impression of the facilities subcommittee that between the superintendent and the chief financial officer, they would come to an understanding with Mr. Cody that is mutually acceptable by all parties. And I would assume if I'm Mr. Cody, that there's a there's a pot in there that once all the projects are done, allows me to go back to my initial position and everybody, that's why it would be a temporary realignment. How many years are we talking to complete all these? Six, well, Baldwin's gonna take two if we do it. We're talking four or five years if we do the unified high school. Yeah. So you're talking putting somebody in a position for seven years? Uh, potentially. Well, and the superintendent would have to make a recommendation to us. On, I, don't, I don't disagree with doing this with Mr. Cody or anybody else, but this is something that is a management function, not a school committee function or a facilities committee function. The motion on, on the floor has been seconded. Is there any further discussion on this? Ms. Vanilla. I just have one thing to say, and that's thank you, Mr. Cody, for all the double duty you have pulled for the last five years, six years. It's, it's greatly appreciated. We're going to give you a break now. We're just going to bombard you with one thing. <laughs> I see no further discussion. Ms. Lissy, please take a roll call. Ms. Vanilla. Yes. Mr. Chauvin. Yes. Ms. Grant. Yes. Mr. Ney. Yes. Mr. Larby. Yes. Mr. Marino. Yes. Ms. Duby. Yes, the motion carries 7 to 0. We are now in discussion items. Um, the first discussion item is Slater Middle School. Dr. McWilliams. Yes, I'd like to give an update on Slater Middle School. As you know from the last school committee meeting, we did have some discussion about um, the um, administration there. And as you know, Assistant Superintendent Ramsey has been overseeing that school very closely. Um, myself and Assistant Superintendent Rabbit have also been visiting in the school on a regular basis, as well as other um, administrators in our central office team. And I've met with the staff a few different times. Um, we have actually had an ad out for a principal through school spring and the search committee made up of the Slater staff, teachers and the administration there, did um, meet last week and look through the very few, I wanna say handful of applications um, that came forward. And they did make a decision to hold some interviews today. After that, they made a decision to extend the search. So there was not um, a candidate that they felt was um, the best fit for the school. So we are going to, um, my expectation is to come to you um, at the next meeting with a recommendation to expand our search and I'll hold that off till then. And then I would also like to say, as far as um, it was raised at the last meeting regarding the culture of the building. And I have to say that in meeting with the staff, I have seen, you know, such a, um, 
uh, a sense of wraparound and in, in, in really taking ownership of the school um, and wanting to uh, work together as a team and also speak the same language. They did have a PD yesterday. Uh, we did bring in Boys Town, which is an organization that um, works very closely with staff on, on these types of things like school culture and trauma-informed um, addresses that. So they had a full day of uh, that training yesterday. And from what I understand from Assistant Superintendent Ramsey, that it went really well. And they're looking forward uh, to that partnership with Boys Town. So I do think that we're moving in the right direction. Um, it's just going to take a little bit, you know, a little bit more time to find the right administrator. Uh, Ms. Mack, I apologize. I didn't hear what you had said in regards to um, um, who was looking through the application? A search com the search committee. So the search committee is. So who who do, what does the search committee consist of, and is it the same for for all? Okay. Yeah. So who does the search committee consist of? So now with the change in um, the law and site-based leadership, it's really important. And actually there's a lot, there's, it's on the books with the, the uh, school site is supposed to be the ones that are driving um, the hiring in, in their building. So um, the search committee is made up of, it's always going to include HR because, and that's Assistant mm -hmm. Superintendent Rabbit. But um, in, in this particular case, it's the staff of the building. So that staff. The whole entire staff? Oh, no, or? not the entire okay. staff, but representation of that staff. So how many people are on this committee? So this particular search committee, my, there was a, 11? 11. So it's uh, uh, HR, 10. 10. Teachers and I believe they, uh, the, the two administrators. Plus the two administrators, mm -hmm. so there's 12? No, 10, 10, 10, 10 total. 10 total. Correct, Mrs. So there's eight, eight staff and two administrators. Okay, so um, Assistant Superintendent Ramsey and Assistant Superintendent Rabbit, six staff and the two administrators. So that's 10. Okay, and how many applications were there? I believe it was there five. Nine, okay. And the search committee came together last week and reviewed all those applications and selected from there. And they had done some interviews and decided Today. that there wasn't anyone right. who was acceptable for the position. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Knight. Who makes that hire? Who makes that decision finally? The final decision mm -hmm. of the selection? So it goes through the uh, committee yeah. and then the committee recommends to the superintendent. And is in law that you have to take their recommendation? Uh, no, but okay. I would certainly be looking at the expertise of the people on site in the building who are going to be working with the administrator every single day. Have you reviewed the nine applications? Yes, I did. Any other questions on? Oh, Ms. Grant. So you do feel that we're going in the right direction? I do feel like the culture of the building is heading in the right direction, yes. Let me ask you a question. Why do you think that? Is it because you feel like they feel like they're involved in the process? I do. I think it's that. But I also think that there is um, systems being put in place and consistency that is beginning to be built. and. Uh, yeah, but just for an, a simple example, when the days when I've been visiting there, I saw, um, you know, a student, and I, I came to know him because I was there for a few hours, and he had his hoodie on, and I watched, you know, a staff member say, "Ooh, call him by name, take his hoodie, hoodie down." And then later on, when I was down the hallway, I saw the same student, gray hoodie, and I said, "Ooh, didn't we already talk to you about taking your hoodie down?" So it's, I know it sounds very simple. But it's consistency like that, that where the students know that they're going to be held accountable and that there are boundaries and there are systems in place. That's just one example. But I believe that, you know, and maybe Assistant Superintendent Ramsey, I don't know if you have any more to add to this, but adding things in, in systems in place that are consistent is, is number one. And then number two, making sure that the students are aware of what they are, having those expectations. And number three, everyone speaking the same language, being on the same team, and also knowing that what they what they have to say is important. Thank you. Did I, did I, would you like to share? 
there's so much that I could share that you know I would rather ask some of the questions, but I think it kind of captured a lot of what the staff and the faculty and the administrative team are really working together. I can say, if I might, um, we reestablished a leadership team which comprises of teachers and the central leadership, and we meet regularly <coughs> so we can talk about the different things that are coming up from the staff. We meet as a faculty and then the boys have for presentation and professional development essay is very well received because it's common and it's a common language for everybody to to be able to latch on to. Um, so I would agree that I think we're going in, in a generally correct direction and that, um, follow up and follow through on um, that picture you sent. Thank you. Mr. Chavano. Ramsey, can you repeat that? What about the leadership? <laughs> so we have, um, we've reestablished a leadership team. Okay, stop right there. Yes. Do we have, we're reestablishing one that didn't exist or that wasn't functioning as intended? Um, so maybe that's a, a Lisa Ramsey task, okay? Because I feel as though that uh, leadership in a school building is distributed in nature, not top mm -hmm. down, right? So I think that there's many, many stakeholders that need to be a part of a, a leadership team with many branches so we can all go out and affect change systematically and distributively, right? So it could be a leadership, it could be a Lisa Ramsey term, it's not, but it, 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 for this case in point, it could be. So we reestablish or we establish a leadership team which is comprised of teachers, uh, the intervention facilitator, the uh, the teaching and learning facilitator, as well as the three guidance counselors, the assistant principal, and the um, social workers. Because when you are affecting change in a school with any kind of student, you want to tackle it from every direction. So if Mr. Chabonneau, if I may use that you as an example, if you're having an issue and an assistant principal uh, deals with your behavioral issue, but really it's being stemming from um, a home-based issue. The SEL or social worker will want to come in and together we can wrap around services for you so we can best suit you and get you back into progress and the kids back. So perfect. Does that happen in every one of our schools? Do we have that structure in place in every one of our schools? I do believe that it's happening at several of our schools, but I wouldn't say 100 percent of us. I would think you know the What's the phrase? It's a teachable moment. If right. it's if if we're having that success at Slater, mm -hmm. why why aren't we modeling that dynamic in every school building that we have? Mm -hmm. and, and and quite honestly, I'm embarrassed to say I thought we were. So when you said that it you reestablished, I'm saying well, but it. You know what I'm so, saying. So I do, and and I, and at elementary school, it seems to happen more naturally than I think at the secondary level. But and, I think, and, it, super, not to interrupt, no. I apologize. But I, I I think gone are the days where we 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 expect things to happen naturally. And right. It, I think we need to put in formal that that our our, our faculty, our our administrators are all part of whatever that number is, six people, five people. But to superint Assistant Superintendent Ramsey's point, the, the wraparound services, so that everybody is on the same page and we are all moving our students in the same direction, I think right. is something we should look at as a district. Absolutely. Uh, Ms. Um, Ramsey, I'm just wondering, have you seen a visible change in the student culture since you've been primarily over there at Slater? I, I think I have. They've been very responsive to the consistent message on the part of the staff. Am I going to say we have 100% compliance? I won't. I think that they've been responsive. So in the example that Dr. McWilliams gave about the hoodies, we've, we've done incremental changes, right? So we started with very, very small things like mask compliance. I know it was a law, but it was not always something they wanted to do. So we started with a complete you say it, it's six feet down the hallway, somebody else says it's six feet down the hallway, eventually they're going to comply. We started with something like that. And then we started, we moved into something a little bit more tangible, like backpacks in the locker. That's a safety concern. That's something that I think that we've all 
really kind of tackle with a visible, very tangible approach. Then we moved into hoods and hats and, and bandanas. So we're, we're incrementally changing. And because it's funny because, yes, they'll see a staff member and they'll take off their hat. Now, are they walking five feet down the road or, or up the stairs and putting it back on? They are, but the hope is that the next staff person that they see is going to tell them to take it off again. So I think that we're going to try our very best to. So yes, the short answer, Joanne, is yes. We, we have seen an incremental change. Um, do we have some work to do? We absolutely do, but I, I think that it's support um, and consistency and follow through of all saying the same thing. So the leadership is kind of filtering it out through distributed leadership, the team, the teachers know that when they say, Joe, go put your backpack in your locker, they're going to get that support from everyone else. So it's, it's yes. Thank you. Mr. Knight. We asked on these interviews and these committees for choosing who's who's qualified, who's not. Have we had the union involved in these committees? Yes. Well, that wasn't said. Well, the union are the teachers. The teachers are represented. But they're not all leadership of the union, so they may speak with a different voice. I, I believe the union had a representation appointed for the search committee. Yes. That's what I was asking. Yes. Mr. Pablo. If I may. To, to your point, Mr. Knight, um, the union leadership doesn't, doesn't, in most cases, the union leadership does not sit on interview committees at the building level. We sit on the interview committees for things like a superintendent search or an assistant superintendent search or a director sometimes. At the building level, we are very, um, I, I appoint someone from that particular building. Uh, you know, why would it be me, who's not a teacher at Slater, to sit at a committee to determine what Slater needs? Uh, anyone who has ever listened to anything I say, um, allow for the people who are doing the job to have a say in who, who needs to leave the building, right? The people who are there, the people who, who are in that building every single day should have some, some knowledge of the candidates and have some understanding and some input as to what is necessary in that building. Um, you know, there, there are so many great things happening right now, uh, thanks to the, the directorship of, of Mrs. Ramsey and, and the implementation of this leadership team. And uh, I certainly have chosen a quality union member, a, a union member in high standing, in good standing, uh, who I trust uh, to sit at that committee and have the voice of the union and the voice of her colleagues uh, at that table. So thank you for asking that. Mr. Nello. Just one more question. So two things. Can you repeat the question? Seeing that is working so well, will you reaffirm on a principal level that we have those in our law school. But I will ensure that they all are up and running. Thank you. Um, so I, I took that one discussion item separate because I felt that it was um it was a separate item. The, the remaining discussion items, our monthly vendor report, our budget transfer report, our overtime report, our work order summary, and our role in the suspension expulsion reports, we typically take together for if there are any questions on any of those items. So at this point, I will just open up for discussion on any of these other items that we have in here. Ms. Moreno. Cleaning private schools. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Cleveland Private Schools is uh, funded by ESSA. It's required as part of the uh, ESSA 1. There was a percentage when the state um, issued the um, allocation. We were uh, required to give a certain portion. That did not happen with ESSA 2 or ESSA 3. So the private schools are using, they have a cleaning service going in. Thank you. You're welcome. It's been a while. So I did ask and get answers for a number of questions. 
prior to the meeting. So I asked about the Gloff LED sign, and yes, it was outside funding that took care of that. Um, I asked about the rip the bus passes, and I, I presume. Uh, so I can answer those same questions. Okay. So the, the Ripter bus passes, the amount of 5008 that is purchased with um, a grant fund, it's for um, families um, and um, homeless. <clears throat> so uh, that was a homeless, I think, grant that was used to purchase those. Uh, but just so you know, <clears throat> we do use Ripter bus passes for our transition um, program. Uh, when students go out into the work field with their um, teacher. Um, so that was on, on that. And then you had one about a um, um, t-shirts. Um, yeah, that was shirt space. <laughs> and that was for, yeah, that was shirt space and that was for CTE program t-shirts for one of the CTE programs. And St. Mary's Home. And St. Mary's Home is tuition um, for students that attend that school. And Sergeant Rehab. Uh, Sergeant Rehab is also um, a program where we tuition, yeah, where yeah. we tuition. And the last one was Revity, the solar consultant, it was 27, almost 28,000 mm -hmm. that I questioned. And um, do you by any chance know what the credit is? I, I do not because I got tied up after. So um, I think it's in, it's in my folder that's behind um, with my other meetings, uh, back a few meetings when we talked about the solar credits. I want to, I, I can't remember off the top of my head the total number of solar credits that we had, but I had mentioned that it would be nice if they let us group them together, but unfortunately not. And so the city's looking to possibly get a refund. So I'll find those numbers out and I'll send them to Diana tomorrow. Yeah, if you can explain how that works though, because we are paying this company for their consulting services, mm -hmm. but we don't have access to the solar credits. No, no, we do. We have, so, so here's what happens. So, so um, there was a contract. Um, that the city went in, into and it has, they use light poles and the light poles, some of them are, are school light poles. So we're benefiting by, we earn solar credits and when those specific light poles, so it, let's just say it's a light pole outside of this building, Jenks, we earn credits and then we actually also have usage. Well, we're earning greater credits than usage. So we're trying to figure out if we can use them in, on other accounts. They will not let us transfer them. They did it at one time in the beginning, um, back a, um, a few years ago. Um, and then Revity is where we have the solar panels. I think they might be down in South Kings. I'm not even sure where they are. I'm not, I, to be honest with you, I'd be lying if I uh, um, told you, but I can find that out as well. But Revity is the one who has the land and puts the solar panels, so that's their fee. So there's a fee to pay for, but it doesn't come off um, the national grid bills because it's not national grid, it's, it's Revity. Um, that's doing the solar panel. So that's the fee. But the city is working um, in, in hoping to um, get those fees and maybe apply them another one time because we've built up a lot of credit. So we have some credit bills. So each month that we're, we're earning more, but we, we tend to be earning more solar. And we can't apply them to the other ones that don't, we're not using solar. So can you find out how much we have in credit, please? Yeah. <laughs> it was like 120, but I, don't quote me. Let me find the exact. I'll send it out tomorrow morning. Okay. Um, so no other questions. That brings us to page three of the agenda. Um, and we are on superintendent's update. So what an exciting time it's been. As we celebrated tonight, our basketball players, uh, that was just a great joy. And I love seeing all the students here. Um, International Women's Day that we celebrated last week, that was also wonderful to see. And I know we're gonna recognize them at next um, week's meeting. Our um, high school uh, students just representing beautifully at that event. Um, I also wanna give a shout out to all those who participated in the St. Patrick's Day Parade because I did get to attend that and it was awesome. It was a great parade. Um, I think the biggest I've seen, you know, pre-COVID, last year we didn't have one. So um, it was just really good to see such a wide range of participation. And um, also just saying that I've been visiting schools on a regular
and have a good night. Oh, well, we still have uh, more oh, items. Uh, yeah, we, we this uh, um, Ms. Vanolo actually um, uh, asked that um, I consider putting superintendent update and school committee member updates before the executive session because usually we come back from executive session and no one's here and we're talking to chairs as we say if people were here we would say <laughs> um and so it's um i i'm, I'm glad miss vanilla brought that up and i did do that so we are not saying good night yeah, we're saying good night to you but not to each other um mr larvey uh, no i just uh i think being here for the presentation and seeing um the coaches speak so passionately about their their student athletes is just um inspiring and I, I i know a few of those coaches um i know a lot of those student athletes there was members of the boys club when i was there and working and um it just it's just good to see that growth in them um as they become young adults and to also know that we have some passionate individuals in our schools that uh, are helping our young people um grow thank you mr knight I think we've got a large decision for the city and the schools to make. And I think each and every one of us should be talking to each of our friends and our families and our neighbors to find out what they want. I put it out on uh, Facebook this past week that we were considering doing a um, unified high school and I had an over, overwhelming response that and again this is a limited thing that a unified high school is overdue then I put at McCoy Stadium site and I wasn't quite so heavily in favor I just hope that we get the proper report from the state before we make any decisions. Because what we have is a report that was commissioned first by the city of Pawtucket with the, uh, with the uh, company. And we put the same company on the next investigation, let's put it that way. And I don't think that's giving us the whole picture properly. And I'd ask that we all think about that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Vanilla. Hmm. Okay. So somebody asked me why I didn't talk very much about wellness. So I'm going to talk about the wellness committee. <laughs> <laughs> so the next wellness meeting is March 28th. We do have two presenters that evening. We have a woman, Laudine Coster from Unitas, who is going to let us know what Unitas Pawtucket does for us. Stop looking at your watch, John. <laughs> and we're also going to have um, Chief Martins, who was Major Martins in Pawtucket um, for 28 years. He's now Chief in North Providence, but he's also the president of the Rhode Island Chiefs of Police. And he is doing a presentation on youth prevention, influenced and, influenced and distracted driving. And I thought that would be good to, I will send notification out to the, the principals that, or you can feel free to do that. Um, that he will be there because they do have programs available to put into our schools for our students and prom and graduation are coming. So we'd like to make it through those safely. Um, April 6th, there's a poet. No, nope, somebody else said that. Um, on March 24th, the commissioner will be coming to see the full ambassadors at Little and also a program called Let It Out that I believe was talked about here. Um, I do have other things on the agenda. However, I will send it, um, I will send you the minutes. 
so you know exactly what we did, and I won't have to go through it all here. And then you can ask me if you have any questions. So aside from that, thank you all for your patience. You are wonderful. We appreciate you. Mr. Sharana? Uh, yeah, just a couple of things. And I, I think tonight illustrates that this committee takes their roles and their responsibilities seriously. I echo what Mr. Lobby said. Um, earlier in the year, we, we heard about a football player of ours who, before getting on the bus after a game, went to assist a, a family in need. Um, and today you heard some of these coaches speak with with such such love and, and, and such uh, kindness and, and compassion for their players. And, and the way they all interacted with each other was was great to see. And I think it made our decision that's coming down the road, you know, we would have a sports team that, that would just be the best in the state when you combine all, all of these talented student athletes together. But it also showed that our schools can survive on their own. They, they're thriving clearly in athletics on their own. Um, so at the end of the day, I think we get wrapped up in the decision making, but our students are, not, are, are gonna be fine. Um, and I, I, I love Mr. Knight to death, and I, I think this committee is better for his service on it. Um, but I think a couple of things that I just want to correct is, yes, we hired the same geotechnical firm to do the survey, but it was a completely different survey. The reason we hired them is because they went down initially 20 feet for the city, and they went down 80 feet, 70 feet for us. Um, and at some point, we've got to accept the experts. Um, we're doing the due diligence that this committee is is entrusted to do. Um, and I think, you know, we will eventually make a decision that each one of us believes is right. Um, because that's how we've shown a history of voting. We vote by what each one of us believes to be the best decision for our students. And that's it. And I don't think that I don't think the community can ask much more of that of us than that. So That's right. good night, oh. go <laughs> I know. That's um, right. Like um Erin had mentioned earlier, her um her and I have been um visiting different schools and last week we had taken a trip over to Curtis. Um it was actually the first time I had met um Mrs. DeSantis, um, which it was she was very joyful. Joy, joyous. She was just, she um, seems to advocate for her um, school and um, the, I have to say, our purpose there was to, you know, to other preschools. Um, you know, we always talk about equity for our students and um, I was, I was glad to see that a program that the city of Pawtucket that our city, the, our district had started out a while ago, is um, it's, it's, it's really starting to pick up some steam and move forward. Um, Dr. Gifford um, has been spending more time over there. Um, I think prior to Dr. Gifford, I don't think the program at Curtis was getting the attention that it might have needed. Um, so it was nice to see that um, it was getting the attention that it does need. Um, I think they have goals, um, and I think us as a committee can can help with those certain things. Um, you know, so I think um, I think it was a positive. Um, I also want to um, thank the DPW. Um, Mrs. DeSantis has been um, reaching out to um, someone over there to put a crosswalk in. And um, I'd mentioned to her that I would just follow up. And um, I didn't get too far in it. And then all of a sudden I get a message that it was there and it was done. I believe it was a picture. <laughs> it was, I did, I got a picture, it was done. So, you know, I'm glad, um, you know, I'm just glad we can go into the schools and, and we can help support them. Um, you know, I, I think it's important that we do. Um, in, in a, and I don't want them to be afraid to come to us to help support them because that's what we want to do. We want to make sure that the, 
the teachers, the students, the staff, you know, they, they get what they need. And, and if, if they need us to just kind of, you know, give a little push to, to make sure it happens, then I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, um, because like I said, from what I understood, I actually spoke to someone from DPW and the crosswalk was actually going to be done over school vacation. You know, it got moved up a couple of weeks, but you know, but but it's you know it's positive and and I think we are we all need to be a team and work together. And that's what it's all about. So thank you. Ms. Marino. Um, yeah, um, so I just want to come on. Um, um, to a pull hard, um, mom and high, um, want to um Ms. Manolo and Ms. Grant teed me up nicely for this. Um, I I um sit on the wellness and the special needs subcommittee and it's um I, a, a a joy really because I get to um sit um and serve under these two very capable um women and uh both of them are driving um changes in our district in both the wellness um and I am I all of our subcommittees I think are doing really important work and I think that one of the strengths of this um Committee is that um, first under Mr. Charbonneau, and then um, then we've continued it, just really making sure that we have strong subcommittees and that everyone can have that leadership role to be able to drive um, change in the district. Um, I also want to um, say that I was able to tour the Z space, and that at our budget session, if any committee member is interested, there's a Z space here. So if a committee member on that Tuesday wants to come early to the meeting, um, Dr. McWilliams can set up uh, with um, the, the person who's behind Z-Space 
can be here. And I will say it was very helpful for me to better understand what this was because I couldn't picture it when it was explained. And once I was there and watching the students just really engage with it was um, pretty amazing. And I did get to go to Slater to see that. And so I did get to see Ms. Ramsey um, in action, um, both as the tour of the Z space, but also as, um, um, as she was putting those systems in place and watching her in that role with her walkie talkie. Um, I, was, I really have to commend the work that you've done over there because clearly you have put those systems in place because the school felt very orderly and I was there for passing time and I was um, and so I know that those were challenges that we had been facing. Um, April 28th, yes, so the budget. So like I said, if even just one or two committee members end up being interested, I'm sure that Dr. McWilliams can set that up so that you can come before the budget meeting and um, see the Z space in this building and, um, and, and kind of mess around with the computer like I did. Um, but yes, so unfortunately, I feel like this is like Pavlov. We all think that we're done. And instead, I um, will entertain a motion um, to adjourn to executive session um, to for the purpose of uh, the, in accordance with the vision under Rhode Island General Laws A, Rhode Island General Law 42-46-5A2, litigation for the purpose of discussing and or acting upon Rhode Island General Law 42-46-5A2, litigation, Sulem Rosalino, the city of Pawtucket, by and through its treasurer, Sean W. Strobel, um, do I have to read all those numbers? Okay. Um, Rhode Island General Law 42-46-5A2 litigation curve in the Cave Pathway Project Review. Um, seal executive session minutes and adjourn executive session. Okay. Then a motion to adjourn to executive session by Ms. Vanolo, seconded by Mr. Marino. Um, all those in favor? I mean, sorry, discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Um, we're now in executive session. Okay, we're going to reconvene in open session. Let's just see who's still available. Ms. Vanilla. Here. Shana. Here. Ms. Grant. Here. Ms. Knight. Here. Ms. Marino. Here. Ms. Marino. Here. Ms. Here. Ms. Here. Ms. Here. Ms. Here. Let's just declare out the vote of the 315 22 executive session. The committee voted unanimously on the matter regarding Salim Rosalini versus City of Pawtucket on a matter versus the Perkins Cave Pathway Project Review. The executive session minutes to adjourn the executive session. Thank you. Second. 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 Second.